In part one of this presentation, we saw irrefutable evidence of astonishing corruption. Proof that Jacob Prash and his Moriel accomplices have been habitually engaged in the creation of spoof websites for the purposes of retaliation, using them to dox their enemies, putting videos of their home and listing their phone number. They have engaged in online fraud by stealing logos and posting full-length copyrighted material to give a false impression that it was the real website. Evidence that Jacob Prash impersonated a rape victim online to harass and stalk another victim he deemed an enemy. And many, many other such acts of calculated malice, so wicked even Benny Hinn would blush. We now come to part two, where we will cover Moriel and Jacob Prash's staggering financial impropriety. Proof that Jacob Prash has lied about being Jewish for nearly 30 years and some rebuttals. As was noted in the previous video, all clips and or information used here is protected by fair use as this video is concerned with critique and news reporting. This video is transformative in nature and therefore protected against any copyright claim. As Moriel Ministries is a worldwide organization with branches in 10 countries, everything presented here is newsworthy. All documents referred to pertain to this worldwide organization and or its president and adjuncts. May the Lord use this to strengthen his body and to spare his children from this soul-ensnaring leaven. Most are what Jesus called hirelings. The ministry has become their job. It's their career. They're chasing numbers and money. Indeed, is this a ministry or a business? Uh, this is interestingly a question that Jacob Prash himself has asked of various others, most especially as we have just seen uh, Deborah Menelaus. This is not a question that I or perhaps many others would have ever thought necessary to ask had it not been for the revelation of these things that we have already looked into. Segwaying from that, we will begin with Jacob's other website ventures. We've already seen that Jacob Prash and Moriel have indeed commissioned spoof websites for the express purpose of retaliation and revenge, websites that included uh, near-pornographic material, uh, the doxing of home phone numbers and uh, pictures of people's homes, uh, not to mention a whole host of other things, potentially including cyber fraud. Those are the websites that he's kept hidden. Uh, but as we are dealing with this whole topic of finances now, um, we will begin where I began in my now published uh, letter. Point number six was Jacob's secular business South African websites. Uh, point number seven was Moriel's finances, and these two points are very closely related. Moriel's official response to that was here, Jacob Prash's personal business affairs are none of Joshua Chavez's business, except that Moriel has benefited from the commercial licensing of domain names. Jacob's private business has nothing to do with Moriel. We'll pause there for now. As you're going to see, it very much does have a lot to do with Moriel. And to get our bearings, we are going to listen to some statements from Jacob Prash himself. Most people in Moriel are either part-time or they're volunteers. Most, like myself, are tent makers. They have a secular job or a secular business. Their primary income does not come from the ministry. Pause right there. He's just said, verbally, 
that his primary income does not come from the ministry. Primarily, his income comes from the secular business he's alluding to. In fact, he says most in Moriel are tent makers like himself, right? So he classes himself as a tent maker and one whose primary income, primary, comes from secular business. Now, as far as myself, I do have a secular business and about, again, I can't let the right hand know what the left hand does, so I can't give you figures. For the record, Stephen Furtick also employs this when he's questioned about finances. Stephen Furtick, the heretic, has said, well, anytime somebody questions his finances, he says, well, I can't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. Just a point of observation. But about 60% of my personal income uh, from this business goes to the ministry. About 40% goes to me. That's how I, I divide it. One of the things... 60-40. He gives 60% of his personal income to Moriel, he says, and then he keeps the other 40%. Uh, quite lucrative. Now he's going to tell us exactly what this uh, business is uh, to help uh, clarify exactly what he's talking about. Listen. Things these people said is that I don't have my own business. Please, uh, I shouldn't be telling people my personal business. <laughs> Google republicofsouthafrica.com republicofsouthafrica.org mm -hmm. or republicofsouthafrica.net and find out who owns it. Yeah. I do. Nothing to do with Moriel. Mm -hmm. Profit generating. I split the money. The ministry gets 60%. I take 40%. But I don't tell people how much it is. It's I don't just, want my right hand to know what my left is doing. Basically. It's between mm -hmm. me and the Lord. But okay. I own these intellectual properties that are worth significant amounts of money. In fact, I'm in the process of negotiating with China to, to try to sell them off because I, I don't want to be working in secular business. I, at my age, I just want to do ministry full time. But yes, I do have a secular business and it is income generating and always has been. Go Google it for yourself and see it. Let's just pause for a moment. He says interestingly, that he's in the process of negotiating the sale of these domain names to China. Uh, the irony of this is actually quite astounding, because for approximately the last three years, he has lambasted ad nauseum Deborah Menelaus for selling the Daniel Project, as he put it, uh, to, to China. So the fact that Jacob is in the process of negotiating the sale of his domain name to China uh, just reeks of irony. Not to mention hypocrisy. I, I don't think that he uh, recognizes even what he's saying. Now, of course, he'll say, well, this is a secular endeavor. It's not a ministerial uh, endeavor, right? He'll somehow have some justification for what it is that he does. But he also says, at my age, I don't want to be working in secular business. I just want to do ministry full time as if he doesn't do ministry full time. It's a disingenuous statement. It is a very disingenuous statement. He's making it sound like he's been uh, laboring to, um, to, to, to balance these other uh, endeavors and that he hasn't been doing ministry full-time for the last 30-some-odd years. Well... He offers up something of a challenge. Now, again, nobody would have known about these things had Jacob Prash himself not said this. Go Google it for yourself and see it. Okay. So he apprises everybody of the domain names that he owns, and then he tells everybody, go Google it for yourself. Well, of course, uh, the enemies of Jacob did just that. And... What they found was actually quite astounding. And facts are facts, right? So the domain names are, um, they are owned by Jacob. And they are apparently hosted by GoDaddy. And when you type these websites into the domain appraisal function of GoDaddy, the very uh, organization that hosts these domains, you get a value. 
a value. So republicofsouthafrica.com estimated value just under $1,700. Republicofsouthafrica.net, you can see here, an estimated value of $284. And the .org, an estimated value of $246. That is a combined total value from these three domain names of less than $2,300. That's a sale price. less than $2,300. So the question immediately is exactly how are these income generating? Jacob Prash refuses to answer this question and says, well, it's none of your business how it's income generating. Uh, but the fact that he put out this challenge and claims that Moriel uh, receives 60% of this uh, income-generating business that he has, um, some questions demand answers. Because it doesn't appear that these things even can generate income. They reference in their official comment the um, licensing commercial licensing of domain names. Well, interestingly enough, I received an email on August 9th from a lovely couple who happens to deal in domain name ownership. Okay, down here you read, domain name ownership is legal by the world standards, but we know the basic workings of this scheme as we deal directly with large corporations. With this in mind, one of our largest customers is presently negotiating for their own name.com, for example. They are uh, .ca, they're from Canada, but want their .com for international status to justify an international draw. Let's just put it this way. It is most probably with the company's lawyers and more than likely costly. The big money can only come after the sale of the domain. We assume it is legally plausible that they can sell or trade to the highest bidder and not necessarily to the rightful owner due to proprietor's rights, hence inciting bidding wars. If a person is just leasing the domains, it brings in very little to speak of. Realistically, unless they have thousands of domains to collect from, they cannot justify a decent living. When we set up our website, we learned that it was owned and were informed that our lease was $50 per year. It was interesting, to say the least. You remain in our prayers. So unless you're leasing, uh, for example, Google.com or some massive name, you're not making any money unless you own thousands of domains. And what makes this particularly uh, interesting, uh, for starters, is the estimated value of all three of these domains is less than $2,300. Well, you couldn't possibly lease them for more than they're even worth. So if I assume that you're leasing them for the total estimated value of the domains in general, you'd only be leasing them for a couple thousand dollars, which is just untenable. What makes this particularly interesting is we can go back in time and see what these websites look like on the Wayback Machine. So here is the Republic of South, Republic of South Africa .com, Jacob Prash's domain name. This is a screenshot from 2004. You can see up here, August 28th, 2004. South Africa Government Online, a bunch of random stuff, this old website with some uh, broken images there. What you notice here that I've underlined is immediately it was for sale. Republicofsouthafrica.com for sale, $350,000, which apparently adjusted for inflation today would be something on the order of uh, near one and a half million dollars. So Jacob has been trying to sell this domain name apparently since he purchased it. And it still hasn't sold because if I go to today's version of it, you can see it is still for sale. Republic, this is the .org, the .com is the same. 
Um, uh, this is the uh, dot com here from 2016. You could see they're identical. For sale, for sale. The, these domains are for sale, republicofsouthafrica.com, .org, and .net. Even he himself admitted he's in the process of negotiating their sale to China, something that has not yet been negotiated. Okay, so who could have possibly been licensing these domains? Well, it looks rather like Moriel Ministries was the one licensing these domains, if anybody. Here we go to 2007. Okay, this is a screenshot from republicofsouthafrica.com in May of 2007. And as you can see, Midrash, Firstborn, and Second, Jacob Prash, 68 Minutes. You can see Moriel Ministries. Over here on the side, Table of Contents, you see Merchandise, Missions, Teachings, About Us, Be Alert. This is a version of the Moriel website. Okay, we jump ahead to 2012, and this is a, a clearer uh, version of the Moriel Ministries website. This is just a mirror of the Moriel Ministries website. As you can see in the domain, it is republicofsouthafrica.com. But when you typed in that domain name in 2012, it just brought up Moriel Ministries. In other words, there's no other entity on earth that could have been licensing this domain as it was merely a front for or a mirror for Moriel Ministries. This is May of 2012. You can see up here. Okay, we jump ahead a little bit further. June of 2013. It's another iteration of the Moriel Ministries website. Again, republicofsouthafrica.com is just a mirror of Moriel Ministries in, in its various forms. Itinerary, I mean, Jacob's picture is up there on republicofsouthafrica.com. So who could have possibly been paying for commercial licensing for a web domain that was just a mirror for Moriel Ministries? It would appear then, or it would only be plausible, that Moriel Ministries was paying for the commercial licensing of this domain. Somewhere between 2014 and 2016, it turned into this. Republic of South Africa, the hard facts with all sorts of weird political stuff. Still trying to sell it, but no longer a direct mirror of Moriel Ministries. This is potentially a very convoluted scheme, if, if it is what it appears to be. Which is that Moriel Ministries itself was licensing these domains to, to, to somehow, uh, was, the, the question should be asked, was Moriel the one licensing these domains, paying for commercial licensing? Did Moriel Ministries pay Jacob Prash to license his domains? And that's the secular business that he talks about? Because according to people who deal with, with large corporations and domain name ownership, you're not generating any income unless you actually sell the domain. And, and unless you own thousands of these things, how exactly did you generate the income? Well, that was a question from another brother, who in his letter to Moriel said, simply state the mechanism by which owning domain names translates to significant personal income for Jacob. This doesn't make sense to a lot of people because it is nonsensical. This could be done in one or two sentences. Again, this individual has supported Moriel longer than I have even been a believer, a personal friend of Dave Lister's. For example, Jacob leases the domain names to such and such a company and receives monthly payments from them for said lease, or... Web traffic is forwarded from Jacob South Africa domains to Moriel.org, which generates traffic at Moriel.org and indirectly increases donations that come into Moriel from which Jacob takes personal income. Or such and such a company pays Jacob to allow web traffic from his South Africa domain names to be forwarded to such and such a company's website, and they pay Jacob accordingly for the use of his intellectual property. As evidence, a redacted 
income statement from the income source should be provided. This is a very reasonable suggestion. The point that he mentions here in the middle is, a, is an interesting one. It's, it's one that I myself have floated. Is it possible that Jacob, in his mind, has justified that web traffic is forwarded from Jacob's South Africa domains to Moriel.org, which generates traffic at Moriel.org, at least in theory, and indirectly increases the donations that come into Moriel, from which Jacob takes personal income? In other words, has Jacob found a way to pay himself by using these domain names to forward traffic, at least in his mind, to Moriel.org to then justify getting paid? Is Moriel paying Jacob to, for the commercial licensing of these domains? It's a good question. It's a valid question, especially in light of all of the I have a sec- um, illicit activity we've already seen. But, but here's where it gets particularly interesting. I have a secular business. Okay. I work, as I always have. Just because I don't talk about my secular... I, I'm not in the ministry to promote my secular business. This is the first time I've ever even addressed it publicly. Hmm. But yes, those, the, the, I have domain names that are worth formidable amounts of money. Pause. They are not worth formidable amounts of money. All three of them combined are worth less than $2,300. The fact that he's trying to sell them for between three hundred and fifty thousand and you know one and a half million or whatever the deal is doesn't make them worth that much. Their estimated value is not worth much at all. So how are they income generating? Especially since we have undeniable evidence that they have just been mirror sites for Moriel.org for the better part of a near two decades. Not until about 2014 did they become this overt political South African thing. So who was paying to license those domains while they were just mirrors for Moriel.org? It makes no sense. Incredible amounts of money that generate income. That's my secular business. That's how I put my children through private school, through law school, etc. Uh, I could not do it on a preacher's salary. No. Uh, I could not do it. Uh, again, my business, Moriel profits from my business, but that's, again, personal. Can't discuss that in terms of figures. Moriel profits from his business, he says. And that's the way he was able to put his children through private school and law school. Okay, again. These individuals who deal directly with large corporations say the big money can only come after the sale of a domain. And if a person is just leasing domains, it brings in very little to speak of. But if you want clarification on this, Jacob will just simply tell you it's none of your business. But remember what he said. Go Google it for yourself and see it. But when you Google it for yourself, Jacob says, my personal business is none of yours. Jacob, it became everybody's business the moment you challenged the world to go Google it and see it for themselves. Because some cursory investigation into this yields confusion at best. Or they'll say in their official response, Jacob Prash's personal affairs are none of Joshua Chavez's business. Interestingly enough, Jacob has made it his seeming life ambition to talk about the personal business affairs of uh, Deborah Menelaws and others. But when somebody has a legitimate question due to patent confusion about Jacob's own statements about his business, suddenly it's none of yours. Jacob himself has talked extensively about holding double standards, and how it is an abomination to the Lord. But it's particularly relevant, as you heard him say just a moment ago, I couldn't have done this on a preacher's salary. I couldn't have put my children through law school and private school 
on a preacher's salary. This is a point that Jacob has raised multiple times over the past several years. Listen. Uh, I could not do it on a preacher's salary. No. <laughs> uh, I could not do it. And I don't take it in the form of a, of a regular salary, per se. Uh, it doesn't come in the form of a fixed salary. I don't take a salary from Moriel. I don't take royalties from my tapes or books or anything like that. I don't take a salary from Moriel. Jacob says, I don't take a salary from Moriel. He will talk a lot about royalties. It's a straw man, right? I don't take royalties. Well, that's a separate topic altogether. But he does say, clear as day, I don't take a salary or anything like that. In one statement over here, he says, well, I don't take a fixed salary per se. Remember, plausible deniability is the realm that Jacob operates in. We have seen that extensively already. But it doesn't get much clearer than this. I don't take a salary from Moriel. I don't take royalties from my tapes or books or anything like that. I don't take a salary from Moriel. I don't take a salary from Moriel. And yet we have conclusive proof because he has said, well, sometimes an honorarium will come in, but I can't ask for it, and it's not a fixed salary. Um, he's just playing fast and loose with words, which we're going to see in a minute. But Amos Farrell forwarded another email from David Lister flatly contradicting Jacob's long-standing narrative that he doesn't take a salary from Moriel. Here you go. David Lister, November 5th, 2020, says to Amos, also currently Moriel USA pays Jacob a salary and has handled other items for him over the years. Moriel UK pays Jacob's rent, insurance, car, phone, and other living items. A flat out and out lie that Jacob has been telling for years. So who's lying? Is Jacob lying or is Dave Lister lying? Because Dave says, clear as crystal, Moriel USA pays Jacob a salary. He doesn't say this is some random love offering or some honorarium that came through. He goes on to clarify Moriel UK pays everything else. But what does Jacob say? Listen. For myself, I take no salary in, in the UK and I take no fixed salary in the USA. No salary. Notice how he emphasizes at the end, no salary. But he's playing a game of technicalities here. Pay close attention to what he says and what he doesn't say. I take no salary in, in the UK and I take no... Pause. I take no salary in the UK and... Fixed salary in the USA, no salary. And no fixed salary in the USA, and then he ends it with no salary. Well, this is technically true. Because he doesn't receive a salary from Moriel UK. These are two different entities, related, obviously. So when he starts his sentence with, I don't receive a salary from Moriel UK, that's technically true. And he says, I don't receive a fixed salary from Moriel USA, well, that's technically true as well. It's not fixed, as we're going to see in a moment. But he's lying by omission. He does receive a salary from Moriel USA, and although he doesn't receive a salary from Moriel UK, they pay his rent, insurance, car, phone, and other living items. All of the rest of the things that come with living apparently, according to Dave Lister, and Moriel USA has handled other items for him over the years. Who knows what those other items are? The craft behind these lies is... It's borderline impressive. And if you're not paying special attention, you won't catch it. He says, I receive no fixed salary in the USA. Listen. Take no fixed salary in the USA. No salary. Again, the emphasis. Again, no salary. 
This is a lie. This man is a liar. Habitually, pathologically. No fixed salary. Here's Moriel's tax returns from 2014. As you can see, the only people that are represented as being paid here at the bottom are Dave Lister and Jacob Prash. 2015, Jacob Prash receives nearly $100,000. 2016, Jacob Prash gets about $67,000. Dave Lister, just a little bit behind. They both received near $90,000 in 2017. In 2018, Jacob Prash receives $147,000. You can see it's not fixed. It is a salary. It just fluctuates from year to year. Dave Lister gets about $90,000 that year. And Jacob Prash gets $86,000 the next year. We're looking at an average of $90,000 a year for Jacob and an average of about $70,000 a year for Dave Lister, the two supposed tent makers. Now, Jacob says, no, these are designated funds. Uh, this is just an honorarium. I can't ask for it. If they come in, you know, nobody says I can't give it back. There are so many woven lies into this scheme, it's very difficult to untie it. But he has said, clear as day, I don't receive a salary. I don't take a salary from Moriel. Then he says, well, I don't receive a, a salary from Moriel UK. And I don't take a fixed salary from Moriel USA, no salary. Again, Dave Lister says Jacob is paid a salary from Moriel USA. And Moriel UK pays for everything else. Jacob says, That's my secular business. That's how I put my children through private school, through law school, etc. That's how he put his children through private school and through law school was his secular business. Remember, they say in their official statement, the insinuation, however, that Jacob Prash financed the private education of his children with funds taken from Moriel is as ridiculous as it is defamatory. Then the question must be asked, so why does Moriel pay Jacob a salary and all of his living expenses if his secular business is so profitable? Pay attention here. Jacob is saying his secular business is so... The, these web domains generate so much income, formidable amounts of income, he says, or formidable amounts of money, that on just 40% of that, because he says he gives 60% of it to Moriel, so on just 40% of this formidable amount of money, he's able to pay for his children to have to go to private school and to law school. If it is such a profitable secular business, why in God's good name is Moriel USA paying him a salary and Moriel UK paying for Jacob's rent, insurance, car, phone, and other living items? Jacob Prash and Moriel are frauds. That's the only explanation here. That's the only ridiculous thing here. Ironically, it is defamatory for them to insinuate that my insinuation is defamatory. The layers of manipulation and gaslighting here are astoundingly satanic. And I mean that in the truest sense of the word. So Jacob has such a profitable secular business, and yet still on top of that takes a salary from Moriel USA. And on top of that, allows Moriel UK to pay his rent, insurance, car, phone, and other living items, not to mention other items being handled for him over the years. Is this a ministry or a business, Jacob? Are you going to accuse Dave Lister of lying now? Or are you going to redefine the word salary? Oh, it only gets worse. Listen. We, we support the ministry from, from our own means. I do it for my business. Others, such as David Lister, do it from their secular work and so forth. I mean, Dave Lister has a secular job. Marco has a secular job. Most people in Moriel are tent makers. Twice, he says, Dave Lister... Uh, supports the ministry from his secular business. Okay. So maybe somebody can explain to us why Dave Lister 
is receiving on average $70,000 per year from Moriel. If he's a tent maker, fine. If Moriel's paying him, why can't you be honest about that? I don't know if Jacob just doesn't realize that these are publicly available records or, or what the deal is here. Um, it is worth noting, too, that they claim these are just designated funds, and yet all of the amounts are rounded out to a, a, a perfectly uh, even number. But David Lister is a tent maker, Jacob says, and they support the ministry from their secular business. And yet he and David Lister are making quite a bit of money from Moriel Ministries, in addition, apparently, to their very profitable secular businesses. This is probably how Dave Lister was able to afford a rather large house in Tennessee, Moriel's new home base. But again, he says, we're all tent makers. I support the ministry from my own pocket. Dave Lister says Jacob's paid a salary. Marco's a tent maker. Dave Lister's a tent maker. Maybe we should talk about Marco's secret stipend as a board member because he does receive one. I guess it's not a salary per se. And it's certainly not listed on their public 990 tax forms. But as a board member... Why is Marco's stipend not disclosed to the public? These board members are paid handsomely. And as you can see, objectivity flies right out the window as a result. This is why even heretical organizations have m more independent uh, uh, boards and uh, more, more uh, at least superficial transparency than Moriel does. So how much does Moriel pay Marco? Because when they brought him on as a board member, they started paying him. Paying him to make decisions on behalf of the board. This section, there's some legitimate questions. Pay to play? That's what it sounds like. We're going to talk about some actual embezzlement and what appears to be hush money. That's what it looks like. So perhaps Moriel would like to discuss the secret stipend that they pay to one of their key board members. Another big question in my article was, who exactly is the board? That's not clear either. Right? They don't publicize that John Haller is Moriel's legal advisor, but Jacob refers to him as such in private emails. John Haller is very much invested in the whole Moriel scheme and uh, is present at most, if not all, of their board meetings. So maybe he's not an official board member, or is he? We really don't know. We know that Marco is. Dave Lister at least was. And he has the power of a board member, and Jacob is. And now we got people like Blair, and we know Amos was. And there's different tiers of the board. There's the international board, and then there are pockets of the Australian board members and the Canadian board members, but they all have varying levels of authority. All things that are presumably none of your business. Pay to play, embezzlement, hush money. One of the things I added in my article was this edit. I said, it has since been discovered that certain Moriel board members, including Dave and Marco, receive a Christmas bonus of 10,000 US dollars, which may account for their silence. Also, board member Marco Quintana has purchased a 36-acre parcel of land in Tennessee near David Lister and the new home base of Moriel. The purchase price was $100,000. Did Moriel help pay for this? Did he tell his church he is apparently planning to leave? Here's the link to the publicly available information. Let's get a statement from Jacob. We have stood vociferously against money preachers and word faith preaching financial con artistry, people prostituting the Word of God for their own aggrandizement. We've always opposed it. And therefore, we believe financial transparency is important, important for ourselves, that we're quite open about it. Financial transparency is important until it's incriminating. And then Jacob will say things like this.
Whether or not I donate the Christmas bonus for a U.S. tax deduction, a gift not coming from Moriel, but from a supporter with the gift included in the Moriel annual audit, uh, good luck unraveling that statement, is again none of your business. So much for financial transparency. Anytime you ask for some clarification, even as a supporter, even as a donor, it's suddenly none of your business. This is the type of transparency I would expect from Benny Hinn and about the type of transparency you get from Stephen Furtick. This is not a joke. This is incredibly bad. But he mentions this Christmas bonus. A gift not coming from Moriel, but from a supporter with the gift included in the Moriel annual audit. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. A supporter sends a bonus gift, but it's not from Moriel. It's a Moriel supporter, but it's not a Moriel gift. It's just a bonus for the board members. That sounds an awful lot like hush money. But you want proof of this bonus? It was apparently more than I originally thought. Amos forwarded me the email. Again, from Dave Lister, the secretary of Moriel, on November 30th, 2020. Dave Lister says... To Amos, I'm in the last day of packing. He was moving to Tennessee at the time, Moriel's new home base. As I have uh, two ladies coming in to hyperclean this place this morning, as well as two guys installing a radon fan, we'll transfer 15 Gs U.S., about 11,300 Great British pounds on Tuesday. David. That's right, folks. A $15,000 U.S. Christmas bonus, which, again, Amos was honest and forthright about disclosing, which Jacob uh, admits to while saying it's none of anybody's business. So maybe this is why the board of Moriel is so silent. I guess when you're receiving uh, healthy Christmas bonuses, quote-unquote, like this, this is typically what the world calls hush money. Look the other way. You're getting paid handsomely to stay silent. That's typically, that's what this looks like. But if you ask any questions, Jacob will say, it's none of your business. Oh no, Jacob, financial transparency is not only important to you, stated, but it is important to other people. It is our business. $15,000 Christmas bonus? This is staggering. I don't even know if it's legal. That's a good question. But Amos didn't want to take this bonus. He had a bit of a problem with it, and he was contacted by this gentleman, Marco Quintana, the heir to the throne of Moriel, it would seem. Marco called Amos and pleaded with him to accept the Christmas bonus because he said if Amos didn't accept the bonus, he would feel bad about taking it, and he wanted to take it. So he spent time persuading Amos to accept the Christmas bonus. Bonus. A gift from a supporter but not coming from Moriel, whatever that means. If it's a tax deduction for Moriel then it's obviously related to Moriel. And if you're paying your board members bonuses like this, uh, hard to say this is just an act of Christian charity. I bet you, why why don't you send that bonus to the uh, starving kids in the Philippines? Jacob likes to talk about this orphanage in the Philippines so much. Or various missionaries. I wonder how much of how much bonus money those people see. But if you're one of the people that has to make objective decisions on behalf of Moriel, that's the type of money being dished out. And apparently, the other board members in the various locations also receive some type of bonus. It may not be as much as this. It's hard to know. Of course, Jacob and Moriel will say it's none of your business. This will eventually come out. But apparently, all of the board members receive some type of bonus. So Marco convinced Amos to accept this $15,000 Christmas bonus because, well, he wanted one too. It's all starting to make a little more sense, right? 
Well, the plot just continues to thicken, like molasses. This is a sheet from um, real estate assessment data in Tennessee. I have blurred out all the personal details. Uh, addresses are blurred out. You can't see them, even though it is publicly available. Um, I've, I've blurred those out. This is uh, Marco Quintana and his wife purchased a plot of land in November of last year. We'll zoom in here. As you can see, November 12th, 2020, $100,000. This is $100,000 worth of land in Tennessee purchased by Marco Quintana, the pastor of a small church in California. Now, if we go to Moriel's website, we can see that they have a new office in Dover, Tennessee. It was formerly in Pittsburgh. Dave Lister moved out to Tennessee and established the Moriel home base in Dover, Tennessee. Well, if we compare Marco's uh, newly acquired parcel of land to Dover, Tennessee, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump away. It's not a coincidence. So Marco Quintana purchased $100,000 worth of land right down the street from Moriel's new home base. Now, one needs to rightly ask the question, how does a pastor of a small local church afford $100,000 worth of land conveniently nestled next to the uh, new Moriel base, especially in light of the fact that just a few years ago, Marco Quintana filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Yeah, this is a very valid question, and this is all publicly available information. Marco files for Chapter 7 bankruptcy, and a few years later is able to afford $100,000 worth of land near Dave Lister. Something doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, in passing, I will note that on page 15 of this Chapter 7 filing, Marco had to disclose former spouses. There's his wife, Gina, whose last name I've uh, blurred out for her privacy. Uh, but Marco has been married twice. While Jacob is busy talking about the marriages and or not marriages of various other people from Tim Worth to Jan Markell to pick a person, Jacob's own son, Ellie Prash, has been married twice, and his spiritual son, Marco Quintana, has been married twice, and he was divorced after he became a Christian. These are the former spouses that have to be listed in a bankruptcy filing. But Marco says in the Pastors and Elders section on the Community Church of DeVore that he and his wife, Rebecca, are married uh, in 2004. They have five children. That's an almost true statement. Marco's first child was with his first wife. He kind of left that part out. He said he was saved in 1995, and he divorced his first wife five years later, after he became a Christian. Would it be fair for everybody to conclude and assert categorically that Marco Quintana is now utterly disqualified from ministry on the basis of this uh, newly discovered second marriage? I'll let the masterminds at Moriel decide uh, how they'd like to address that. Perhaps we'll talk about that more later. But the question, that's just in passing. The question we need to ask ourselves is, did Moriel buy Marco's land? Did Moriel incentivize Marco to move to Tennessee to abandon the church that he uh, would apparently claim God called him to pastor um, and to help uh, establish and run the new Moriel home base down in Tennessee? Did Moriel incentivize him and purchase that land for him? Or is Marco's tent making really profitable these days? Does he receive a salary from his church as well as a stipend from Moriel? Maybe he's been getting more... Christmas bonuses, maybe he's been saving up all those Christmas bonuses, but when Moriel is giving out money like this to their board members, the question merits asking. Did Moriel purchase this parcel of land for Marco, or did a man who filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy not too long ago somehow manage to bounce back and buy $100,000 worth of land? That's a lot of money, I don't care who you are. Or is this none of anybody's business either? Jacob created an entire website 
with the premise and, and, and thesis question, is this a ministry or a business, talking about Deborah Menelaus and a cleaning business. And we're looking at some legitimately disturbing, confoundingly incoherent financial discrepancies, and Jacob says, that's none of your business. Interesting. So who purchased that land? One of the things I mentioned in uh, part seven, the Moriel finances, I set up here. I would have never questioned Moriel's finances had these other elements not presented themselves, right? It was only after seeing other things that I realized I, I now have to question everything. Things that I just assumed were okay. Other things that I had heard but ignored. I was also apprised of Jake by Jacob of a situation in Australia that merits mentioning as it is at best a case in abysmal stewardship and anyone on this list who may donate to Moriel deserves to know how funds may be being managed or not. Sometime after the Moriel Australia administrator passed away and Moriel was in the process of replacing her, Jacob said they were convening an emergency meeting to discuss some issue with missing funds. He said that approximately $100,000 had been embezzled by this woman, whose name I forget. Her name is Marge, or was. He said there was no oversight of the Australia branch because they didn't believe that much was being donated. It turns out the woman was apparently living handsomely due to Moriel's neglect of stewardship. I don't know much beyond this, but it further establishes a general pattern of negligence. I think the people who donated all that money deserve to know exactly what happened and how the entire Moriel board should address this. Yet yeah, this is a case of confirmed, uh, admitted embezzlement. And I have found out much more since, but Jacob and the entire Moriel board have known about this for over a year. Moriel's uh, response, one of their... This is one of Jacob's responses to a gentleman in the email thread. He says, Moriel's financial records are duly audited and placed in the public domain. Not all of them, folks. Not when it comes to the embezzlement of perhaps in the, in the neighborhood of $200,000. It was not audited at all because there was no oversight. But I published... This statement, again on August 5th, I asked the question August 3rd in the private email. August 8th, just a few short days after I made my letter public, what do you know, the Moriel Australia Board has an official statement. This is called damage control. They were trying to cover up this embezzlement, and because I made it public, they, they had to say something about it. So here's what they said, among other things. They described this as significant financial mismanagement, misappropriation, and impropriety. Um, it says that um, we are now in a position to stake this to state this fact indubitably. Now, conveniently, just a few days after I make my letter public, what impeccable timing I have. No. This is damage control. They had been in a position to state this fact indubitably for over a year because they were floating the idea of suing this woman's son for the will that she left to him that she apparently reneged upon on her deathbed. So they had lawyers involved. They were talking about suing her son to uh, reclaim the will from money from him. It's a whole mess, a whole big mess that they think is none of your business. But now, just a few short days after my letter, now they were in a position to indubitably state this. This is a lie. They're all liars. They said, they, they admit their motive in, in publishing this. Look at, in light of extraordinary evidence and malicious attacks upon Jacob, it is necessary to make an explicit statement to you, our co-workers in Christ. Okay, it wasn't necessary a year ago when they knew about this. It was only necessary in light of all these other things that I tried to bring to light, and in passing mentioned, yeah, the embezzlement in Australia. 
So they say above that, Jacob wasn't present in Australia when this information was discovered. He reacted with disbelief, dismay, brokenheartedness. Both Jacob and Moriel neither rejoice or gloat in the situation. Okay, nobody accused Jacob of doing the embezzling. But we can absolutely accuse Jacob of uh, conspiring to cover this up and admitting his own culpability. These are his own admissions. One statement from Jacob to the Moriel board, including Amos, said, Marge embezzled a lot more than 50000 A lot more than 50000 Moriel refuses to tell us exactly how much. Even though they're in a position to indubitably state the facts, they won't tell you the facts. How much money was squandered under the lack of oversight from Moriel Ministries? She embezzled a lot more than 50K. Former board member seems to think it's probably closer to 200,000. And I remember Jacob stating $100,000 was missing to me. I didn't have any details. I didn't know what he was talking about. But there was a whole lot of confusion, apparently. And $100,000 was missing. Well, apparently it's more than that. And according to Jacob, it's a lot more than even 50. Well, here's what Jacob told the group in October of 2020. You can see up there, October 10th, 2020. Okay, nearly a year ago. If Tim Worthless or Kawhi or any of these vultures got a hold of this, they would try to crucify us on the web. Shh. For our own protection and reputation. No, notice the motive. It's not because it's the right thing to do. Not because we're supposed to steward everything. Not whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. No, for our own protection and reputation. Th this is a motive of a worldling. We need to implement the kind of centralized accounting uh, oversight and have it in a written statement. So you're telling me that a ministry operation with 10 formal locations worldwide just simply had no centralized accounting oversight in Australia? They had to find out, uh, go back through who knows how many years of records to find out, oh, we didn't have any oversight at all. We've been operating a worldwide ministry with a big website that was mirrored by three different South African domain names even at a point, but you had no oversight? Notice what he says, though. If any of these vultures got a hold of this, they would try to crucify us on the web. So what did Jacob and Moriel conspire to do? To hide it. Until just a few days after I made my letter public. Even though Jacob wrote this in October of 2020. They say, now we're indubitably in the position. No, you were indubitably in the position then. Jacob continues... Contrary to their official statement, he says, the buck stops with me. I am partly to blame for letting this happen. I carry the ultimate responsibility. Uh, responsibility. Um, I was wrong and stupid, mea maxima culpa. That's a stark contrast from the official Moriel uh, Australia statement saying, Jacob didn't know anything. And in, in light of extraordinary evidence, which they've had in their possession for a year, uh, and malicious attacks upon Jacob, they either don't know the definition of the word malicious, or the word attack, or they're just liars. I'm going with the last option there. It is necessary to make an explicit statement to you. Translation. Josh brought this to light, and now we have to say something. Damage Control 101. Doreen Virtue couldn't do a better job than Jacob Prash when it comes to damage control. But Jacob admits, if they got a hold of this, they'd try to crucify us. So they all tried to hide it. Jacob says he's partly to blame. He bears the responsibility. He was wrong. But of course, he only says this to a small group of Moriel insiders. He didn't say this to the public. He didn't say to the Moriel public that the buck stops with him. He was wrong and stupid. 
he shouldn't have done this, there should have been oversight. He didn't admit to them that they didn't have any centralized uh, accounting oversight. No. Nope, they they played dumb. Oh, well, we found out about this, and this woman, Jacob, didn't know anything. Nobody accused him of doing the embezzling, but he himself admits he didn't know what was going on. Nobody did. To say that this is a neglect of stewardship is a radical understatement. So, the brother, again asked in his letter, trying to clarify many of these things, he says, publicly disclose exactly how much money was embezzled by the deceased admin of Moriel, um, Moriel, Australia, and explain how, when, and why it happened. I believe it's appropriate to publicly disclose this as good stewards of the widow's might and for the sake of full transparency to all past, current, and future Moriel donors. Yeah. Also explain what recourse there was, if any, and how Moriel identified and addressed the root cause of the embezzlement to prevent it from ever happening again. Please, no obfuscations, no technicalities, no ambiguous language, no deflections, no equivocation. Only clear, honest statements and actions before the Lord. Otherwise, please don't bother to respond at all, as it would only add unnecessary noise and confusion and make the situation more difficult. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must answer. Hebrews 4.13, grace and peace, art. This brother who has supported Moriel for, I think, at least 15 years didn't even receive so much as a reply. Moriel, nobody. Not Dave Lister, not Marco Quintana, not Jacob Prash. None of them even humored his legitimate request to clarify these things. Why? Because they couldn't. Perhaps they took his last point. They knew they were going to have to resort to obfuscation, technicality, ambiguous language, deflection, or equivocation, and they couldn't respond without those elements. So they just chose not to respond at all. Oh, but they'll call this a malicious attack. Josh is a bitter backstabber. This isn't about Josh. This is about reality. A reality that is caught up to Moriel in full force. I'm just a messenger. This brings us to Moriel, New Zealand, which, according to the Moriel website, is one of their ten formal branches worldwide. Yet, according to the New Zealand Charity Services website, an official government website, Moriel Ministries was deregistered in November of 2017 and has not been re-registered since. But what led to this? According to the commission, quote, this entity was removed from the Charities Register under Section 32 b of the Charities Act because it failed to file annual returns as required by Section 41 of the Charities Act, end quote. Another financial fiasco emerges. Moriel once again squandered its stewardship and were deregistered by the New Zealand government for failing to obey the laws. But the plot thickens. In this 2016 Moriel Quarterly article, Jacob Prash offers this peculiar statement, quote, At long last, Marge and Raywin will no longer need to fly Moriel New Zealand by remote control from Australia, as they've done since Nigel went home to be with the Lord. But Pierre and Margaret Mosley are getting ready to assume the administration of the New Zealand branch, end quote. So, Marge, the woman who embezzled at least $100,000 from Moriel, Australia, without anyone in Moriel having a clue about this due to absolutely no oversight, was running the New Zealand branch remotely. One year later, after a new couple took over, they failed to file annual reports and were deregistered. Were they embezzling money from Moriel, New Zealand as well? It sure sounds like it. And yet Jacob and Moriel claim all their branches are registered charities and report all finances according to the laws. They've lied again. While Moriel has New Zealand represented as an official branch on their website, according to the New Zealand 
official government charity's website, there is no Moriel. There was only ever one, and they were removed for failure to report. So what is Moriel, New Zealand? Do they collect funds? How are they a branch? As you can see, Moriel's financial impropriety goes deeper and deeper. Remember that you will give an account for the stewardship of your funds, and if you continue to give money to this corrupt organization after seeing this dereliction, you will give an account to the Lord. Stop giving them money. And therefore we believe financial transparency is important, important for ourselves, that we're quite open about it. Yeah. So Jacob says in a private email, Marge embezzled a lot more than $50,000. Well, Jacob and Moriel, if financial transparency means so much to you, then you need to disclose exactly how much was embezzled and gambled away, etc., and whose fault it was. We already know Jacob has admitted the buck stops with him, but he said that privately. And then they tried to conceal it for about a year until I made it public, and then conveniently a couple days later they were in a position to indubitably state the facts, even though by their own admission they said they were basically doing so because of malicious attacks against Jacob. This isn't an attack. This is a disclosure of the truth. But that's what the spin doctors call it. Financial impropriety is an understatement. $15,000 bonuses to board members? A a business that supposedly funds uh, Moriel to the tune of 60% of it? Jacob claiming he never gets, uh, uh, doesn't get a salary? And he had enough money from his secular business to put his kids through private school and law school, and yet he's still taking a salary from Moriel USA while allowing Moriel UK to pay all of his living expenses? This is a mess. A massive mess. But how deep does the business go? Jacob says, on multiple occasions... We don't sell. We made a big decision not to sell recorded materials. We just put everything for free online. If they got this much money leaking out here, how do they fund these things? Well, let's get some statements from Jacob. Something I just have to mention very briefly. Um, Moriel.org is our website. And if you visit our website, Moriel.org, You can download any of our recorded material absolutely free of charge. He says that's on Moriel.org. You can download anything for free on Moriel.org, their website. There's no charge. It's free. At one time, we had to charge people copying, postage, shipping, things like that. We don't have to anymore because of the internet. We can just give it away for free, at least for the time being. All that for free download. We just took everything and we put it online and we stopped pretty much selling it unless people order it. But we're not trying to finance the ministry by the sale of recorded materials anymore or anything of that nature. It's just out there. But the best, of course, is just to go online and download it for free. It's there for free. It's there for free. Well, here's Moriel.org, online store, Moriel.org. These are their MP3 downloads. And as you can see, they're all $4 a piece. That is the exact opposite of free. $4 a piece. This is exorbitant. It would be a lie if it was $1, but $4 for a message to download the MP3? Jacob's a liar. When Jacob belabors a point and says, we don't do this, it means the opposite. When Jacob says he doesn't make spoof websites to attack people, that's exactly what he's doing. When he says, we don't sell recorded materials, That's exactly what they're doing. When he says everything's free on our website, 
That's exactly false. And he's doing this in response to people calling him out. So when he gets in this mode of defending himself, uh, not only does he resort to lying, but he's a projection artist. And he will speak the most loudly about the things that he himself is guilty of. Is this a ministry or a business? $4 for a download? You've got to be kidding me. But it's all there and it's all for free. It's all there and it's all for free, except that it's not. There is not a single free message on Moriel.org. Every one of them is $4 a piece. The very opposite of free. But, you know, if you go to MLJ Trust, the website, Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, website, the, the website that manages all of his old messages, there's a download button under every one of these probably thousands of messages. And uh, there's an add to download cart even there. And you can put a bunch of messages in there. And what do you know? It's actually free. Your free download cart. I can actually download free messages from Martin Lloyd-Jones' website. Thousands of them. How about John MacArthur? Well, if you go to the Grace to You website, you can see up here in the corner, there's an MP3 high-quality download option. If you click on that, takes you to the play, click on that button, there's a download option for free. John MacArthur's Grace to You website allows for actually free downloads. Martin Lloyd-Jones' website allows for actually free downloads. Leave it to Jacob Prash to charge $4 per message, literally nothing free on Moriel.org. So here's all of the options. Here's all the stuff you can buy in the Moriel store. You got MP3s, CDs, and DVDs, collections, books, conferences, and a thumb drive, right? We just saw the MP3s. That's where you would find the free thing. If, if anything was free, it would be there. It's just a download. Nope, you have to pay $4 per message. You want a message on Church for the Churchless? That'll cost you 4 bucks. Never mind Jacob's statement that everything's there for free. I guess he didn't think people would actually look into this. I, I, I don't even have a, an answer at this point. It's almost like he lies for fun. That seems to make the most sense. There you go. You click on the MP3. There it is. $4. $4. $4. Everything is $4. Okay. Okay. What else do we have up here? Obviously, you're going to have to pay five to ten bucks for the CDs. You got to pay for the books. You got to pay for whatever. Okay. But there's a uh, thumb drive down here. There's the thumb drive. We'll click on that. Okay. Here's all these thumb drives. Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. We got one down here. Four hundred and fifty dollars for the whole enchilada. A four hundred and fifty dollar thumb drive. This is shockingly exorbitant. But I want you to pay attention to how Jacob tries to justify this in what is, I'm not joking or exaggerating, a near classic and near verbatim infomercial template. Listen. What we do there is try to keep it cheap. If you were to buy 500 audio cassettes, I'm, I'm sorry, audio uh, CDs, that'd be like 25 hundred dollars that's too much to buy the entire catalog so much. what we've done is put them onto a thumb drive for four hundred and fifty dollars instead of twenty five hundred you can get all 500 plus sermons uh, i suppose he's laughing at how ridiculous he sounds I, I, is this funny that's that's the only you have to laugh or you'll cry this is ridiculous Four hundred and fifty dollars. He's trying to justify for four hundred and fifty dollars instead of twenty five hundred. You can get all five hundred plus sermons uh, because we don't want to charge people five pounds each. We want to charge people less than one. I'm sorry, five dollars each. We want to charge them less than one dollar each. I don't know if he realizes he slipped there. He says we want to charge people less than a dollar. He wants to charge you. So you can get what we call the whole enchilada for a couple of hundred bucks, about 
385 sterling. We'll give you the full 2,500 pounds worth of everything free. And we put them on thumb drives so we can give give it to people for like maybe less than 20% of that cost. Uh, save 80%. Save 80%. Here's a Howcast website about how to make an infomercial. I, I, wish, I wish this were a, a joke. This is how incredible this is. How to make an infomercial. Step five. For a big finish, overprice your product by an unconscionable amount. Then slash the price in half and throw in a cheap related gadget. Finally, offer a two-for-one deal and never-before-seen prices. Have a deep voice announcer tell people how to order. Then start thinking of the next product you can sell today. So Jacob goes on about how, you know, if, if you were to purchase this many CDs, it would cost you $2,500, but that's too, mu- too much. Call today, and we'll slash that price by 80%. You'll only pay 20% of that. This is astounding. $450? What are they really charging for? That thumb drive right there that costs $450, the, the actual device itself... The, the the hardware is $7 on Amazon for a 32 gig thumb drive, which is more than enough to to put 500 hours worth of audio, if, if it's that much. He said it was over 500 sermons. There's 405 the technical discrepancy, but anyway, about 100 less than he said. Anyway, just to show you, literally everything is not what he presents it as. Everything is a, is a lie. Everything. 32 gig thumb drive costs about $7. A modern computer could transfer all of those files to that thumb drive, certainly in less than an hour. So we'll just factor in a generous $20 an hour for labor. That's $27 for the labor and the goods, right? I'll round up a few dollars and call it 30 to be fair. We'll factor in, how about another 10 for shipping and handling, Right? Let's just even take that out. That that would be an additional uh, in addition to this anyway. So thirty dollars is, is is a fair for the goods and the labor to get that on there. Thirty dollars. So what's the other four hundred and twenty dollars they're charging for the information? They're charging four hundred and twenty dollars for the information itself. Four hundred and twenty dollars. Wow. You can download John MacArthur's messages for free. Jacob will charge you four bucks. I don't know if I've seen uh, a price that high, but how he tries to justify it. This should cost you $2,500, but see, you're getting a good deal. This is infomercial template 101. But listen. You can get it for free. Free? An ugly rumor has unfortunately begun by the usual culprit. Again, somebody who just lied, Stuart Menelaus lied, and said we sell our products for exorbitant prices. Yeah, no, actually, Stuart Menelaus told the truth, Jacob. That that Jacob can sit there with a straight face and say, somebody who just lies, these ugly rumors. I don't think I've seen a person more devoid of conscience, even by worldly standards, as Jacob Prash. Yes, $450 is exorbitant, considering a generous estimation of the physical cost of the uh, thumb drive and the labor that it would take to transfer those files is about $30. That means you're charging about $420 for the information. But Stuart lied? No, Jacob, you lied habitually, apparently, about everything. Um, No, we give them away cheap. How cheap? Free. Free. So, apparently, Jacob Prash doesn't know the difference between free and $4, because literally nothing is free. That is directly from moriel.org. John MacArthur doesn't charge $4. Jacob Prash does. But he emphatically states, it's free, it's free, it's free. No, it's not. To begin with, I've never taken a penny in royalties from the sale of any recorded material. 
Now, of course, everything is free online. Nope. You can't profit from something you give away for free. Does that include the whole enchilada for $420 worth of inflated price? It's impossible. Or the uh, $4, $4 per uh, message there. We encourage people to download, copy, and circulate our stuff. Freely you've received, freely give. I can't believe We don't it. have to do that anymore. We used to have to charge people for postage and for copying costs and for CD covers. And we don't, not, we can just give it away now. It's not. You, you could give it away, but you don't. And that's what makes you a deceptive liar. You could give it away, but you don't. You could sell the whole enchilada for $420 generously, for $430. Sorry, you could sell it for $30. But instead, you've jacked the price up by a, a, an additional $420 for the cheap price of $450? So much for freely, you have received freely give. That's all they're charging for is the information. But he'll talk about how he doesn't take royalties from his books. It's a big straw man. That has nothing to do with the rest of this. It's like somebody being on trial for, you know, a homicide. And I said, yeah, but I wasn't jaywalking. Okay. We're not talking about jaywalking. That's a, that's a different thing. And even if you're not guilty of that, this other thing is still a pretty big deal. But nice try deflecting with this red herring. I don't take royalties from my books. Okay. You're telling me $450 is a reasonable, pr reasonable price for a thumb drive? Or lying about there being free downloads on moriel.org is okay? No, it's not okay. It's not a business, but if you want to order it, we'll make you the CD. Uh, or the DVD, but otherwise just take it free as most people do. Take it free. If you want to buy the whole thing, instead of paying $2,500 for 500 titles, we'll give it to you for less than 20% of that cost. Uh, less than a dollar a sermon or a dollar or whatever. Just, we're not in business. We're in ministry. And we want to keep it that way. Again, when Jacob Prash emphatically states something like this, it's exactly the opposite as we've seen. When he says, I've never created a spoof website to attack anyone, we know that he's lying. So when he keeps saying we're not in business, maybe we should be asking ourselves, is he? He's quite the projection artist. Here's what he said about me. What triggered Joshua Chavez to get the dagger? He was uh, trying, the spin doctor, hard at work. What triggered Joshua Chavez to get the dagger out and attack us without warning? In a single word, money. There's the projection artist. Like Studio Scotland, so now he starts comparing me to them. Service Christie became... Uh, legally became a commercial business, but misrepresenting itself to be a ministry. Joshua Chavez registered Service Christie as a commercial LLC, limited liability company, in New Mexico, USA. Well, uh, let's start from the bottom up. Uh, apart from the fact that he misspelled Christie there, um, Service Christie Ministries was registered as an LLC at the suggestion of Jacob Prash. The pathological liar. When I was threatened with a frivolous lawsuit, I was looking into different types of insurance and had no uh, ban. There was, there was nothing to tie the insurance to. I'm just a guy. Okay. And so in order to get this insurance... I asked Jacob, do you think it's a good idea? Should I should I make an LLC maybe and then put everything under that umbrella that maybe this would be a good idea? Jacob agreed. 
So there is a Service Christi Ministries LLC on paper that I have done absolutely nothing with. It was placed on paper for a very practical reason, and I never pursued it any further. I did not acquire the insurance. I don't even know where the paper is. I don't know if the LLC is still uh, registered. But Jacob Prash himself agreed with this idea. It wasn't for some uh, commercial business reason. It was for an insurance reason. But what makes this so astounding, again, as the, as the projection artist would have it, he says, this is what actually happened and why. It's a matter of an LLC and monetization. Look, Moriel is not and never will be a monetized LLC. Yeah. Well, you know what is an LLC? According to opencorporates.com, the Remnant Truth Network LLC. That's right. The Remnant Truth Network featuring Jacob Prash and Moriel Ministries. If you can see, the director and officer down here is David Lister. What do you know? A domestic limited liability company registered in Austin, Texas, presided over or directed by David Lister. You know, the RTN TV online Bible study that Jacob Prash talks about? Yeah, that's an LLC. So while he's lamenting that Service Christie Ministries was registered as an LLC, he happily operates under the banner of the Remnant Truth Network, LLC. What a staggering, gaslighting hypocrite. You can't write this stuff. This is insane. Shameless. A shameless liar. There you go. Devore Truth with Marco Quintana and John Haller and Moriel and Sandy Simpson. You know what their RTN TV website has that mine doesn't? A big, shiny, massive donate button just flashing at you on the page with all kinds of credit cards. Is this a ministry or a business, Jacob? I don't have one of those. A big, flashy donate button. Leave it to the man who takes infomercial templates to lament an LLC that he suggested I register for insurance purposes. My goal is money? I got a funny way of promoting my so-called commercial business. I didn't even produce a video in about five months. This man is such a liar. It's incredible. This is what actually happened and why. Notice what he says. It's a matter of an LLC and monetization versus a non-commercial ministry. It's interesting that Jacob mentions that. Well, here's a video from YouTube. You could see Devore Truth. That is Marco's, Marco Quintana's channel, right? There's a couple of videos here. We'll click on this, click on this video. And oh, what do you know? There's an ad on Marco's video. Advertisements or monetization. What does Jacob Prash have to say about that? I'm sure the spin doctor has some kind of justification. That's Devore Truth with Marco Quintana. Okay, let's pop over here to Fellowship Bible Chapel with John Haller. Okay, let's click on this video. And what do you know? An ad. There's an ad on John Haller's uh, channel and, and video here. Fellowship Bible Chapel. Monetization. Does Jacob have a problem with that? Or is he a lying hypocrite? How about uh, how about Dean uh, Dean Gibson here? Dean Gibson, click on this. Oh, what do you know? This is a Jacob Prash video. Jeremiah twenty three. Woe to the pastors. Jacob Prash, and what do you know? There's an ad on it. Monetization from Jacob's new sister ministry, Dean Gibson, the man that apparently helped him construct one of his several fake websites. Um and who has conspired to uh, help him pass on his lies. There you go. So much for lamenting monetization. On that note, again, I must reinforce that you go to Devore Truth, 
to Fellowship Bible Chapel, to Dean Gibson's channel, and, of course, to Moriel Ministries, and you unsubscribe from them immediately. Purge from yourselves the evil person. Is this a ministry or a business? He says, Moriel is not and never will be a a monetized LLC. Oh, but the Remnant Truth Network is. And there's ads on all three of those channels. Hmm. But uh, I'm a commercial business, he says, misrepresenting myself. While Jacob is apparently literally misrepresenting every aspect of himself. But on the moriel.org website, on the official website, they have links to their quarterly. All right, there you go. Moriel.org newsletter, publicly available on their own website. You can see the Moriel branch office, Moriel UK, where Jacob lives in the United Kingdom. Natalie Alon, who has uh, enabled Jacob to lie, unfortunately. This is a woman I once considered a, a, a friend, somebody that I've met. And um, somebody who has sadly been uh, wooed by all that appears to glitter in Moriel. Well, you can see she's the leader, the director of Great Britain, Great Britain Administrator. And the address in the United Kingdom there, 118 Pall Mall, London, SW1Y5ED, England, United Kingdom. Okay. 118 Pall Mall. Anybody from the United Kingdom probably instantly recognizes at least part of this address. This is a fairly sought-after neighborhood in general, a well-recognized neighborhood. And if we input that address, 118 Pall Mall, London, SW1Y5ED, into uh, Google, what do we get? Well, we get an address at the prestigious Institute of Directors. You can see down here, raise your company's profile with a prestigious London address at 118 Pall Mall. Interesting. Institute of Directors virtual office can offer you and your business all of that and so much more. Choosing to work with Institute of Directors virtual office and registering your company in Pall Mall will not only raise the profile of your business and give it more a more professional image, but it will also increase customers' trust in your company and their feeling of security. A SW1 postcode and a London uh, phone number will position you right in the heart of the capital at one of the most desirable locations for any firm in the United Kingdom. So Moriel UK is firmly yoked up with an organization tailored for doing business. Is this a ministry or a business? Institute of Directors, where directors are made, run by directors for directors. If you're looking to connect to develop and influence your network and the wider business community, it says down here there are over 25,000 of us and we're all in it together. Together, We believe better directors make for better business. This is all about business. But if you're not convinced, how about the about section? We were awarded a royal charter to support, represent, and set standards for business leaders, like Jacob Prash. Your point of view as a business leader, um, seeking the opinions of the wider business uh, community, including access to business information, reach your full potential as a business leader. There is little telling what coming years hold, will hold for UK business. It says that they encourage entrepreneurial activity and promote responsible business practice for the benefit of our members and the business community as a whole. It would seem that Jacob Prash, while he is lamenting the uh, illusory uh, business endeavors of others, is himself firmly steeped in not only uh, actual business, but such financially uh, improper shenanigans for lack of a better term, as I could see re- resulting in a serious investigation at a level much higher than Joshua Chavez. This is staggeringly bad in every possible way. 
He has lied for years about taking a salary. We now know that he's not only paid a salary, but Moriel UK pays all of his living expenses. Yet he claims his secular business is so profitable he sent his kids to private school and law school on only 40% of that income, and yet still has the audacity to take a salary and have all his living expenses paid for by Moriel and then says the insinuation otherwise is as ridiculous as it is defamatory. The only ridiculousness is coming from Jacob Prash and Moriel, and the only potential defamation is actually coming from Jacob Prash and Moriel. And yet he will not disclose by what mechanism he claims that these web domains make so much money because he cannot disclose by what mechanism, because there is no mechanism. He's still negotiating the sale of these web domains to China. Then he conspired to cover up the embezzlement that is somewhere between 50 and maybe $200,000 in Australia to salvage his own reputation, even though he privately admitted he was partly to blame. The buck stops with him. Mea maxima culpa. He was wrong and stupid. Publicly, it was the exact opposite. It was damage control so that his reputation didn't take a hit. But those people that donated their hard-earned money to what they thought was a worthy cause apparently didn't deserve to know. It was none of their business what happened with all that money. Only after it was disclosed in my public letter did the cowards at the Morial Australia office decide to make a statement that they could now indubitably uh, corroborate facts that they had known for a year, a.k.a. damage control. And then we saw Jacob lie about how they don't sell recorded materials when that's all they do is sell recorded materials. There's nothing free on Moriel.org. There are $4 per message or a $450 whole enchilada thumb drive inflated conservatively by about $420. But Jacob questions the business practices and the... um, says that my motivation was money. He'll accuse anybody of anything. Spin doctor, projection artist, gaslighting, hypocrite, liar, all applicable here. Is this a ministry or a business? Well, Jacob is firmly situated at 118 Pall Mall with Moriel UK, which is designed all for business and to enhance a business profile. This is as bad or worse than the previous chapter or act about all of these spoof websites. Let us not forget Marco's secret stipend that Moriel doesn't disclose but should and his $100,000 purchase of land conveniently nestled near Dave Lister in the new Moriel home office by a man who filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy not too long ago. Did Moriel purchase this land for him? We know that they give out ten dollars to $15,000 Christmas bonuses to their board members, which rather looks like hush money. If you have donated any money to this organization, you need to stop immediately. Because if money is being embezzled, they just won't tell you. We know that because they didn't do it in Australia. Not until I told you for them. Then they came out with a damage control statement. But they were happy to keep that from everybody for as long as they could because they knew their enemies would try to crucify them and their reputation meant more to them than integrity. This is the behavior of hirelings. It's the behavior of Jacob Prash, who, again, is not just disqualified from ministry, but is disqualified from fellowship, per 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13. He is not even to be eaten with, and you are to disfellowship him and those who are supporting, aiding, and abetting this activity, which includes, but is not limited to, Marco Quintana of Devore Truth, John Haller of Fellowship Bible Chapel, Dean Gibson, Sandy Simpson, Blair Waugh, and many others. And I suspect 
you're going to start seeing a whole lot of finger pointing in the Moriel organization and a lot of people jumping ship because this is what real evidence looks like. But not only has Jacob misrepresented uh, apparently uh, everything or so much of Moriel's finances, etc., It appears rather as though he has misrepresented his very identity for the better part of the last three decades, which we'll get into in Act 3. Well, here we are in Act 3 of this presentation, and in Revelation chapter 3, we read about those who claim they are Jews and are not, but lie. And my, what an application we have before us. And in order to set the stage for those who may not be familiar, if you are familiar with Moriel Ministries or Jacob Prash, It is very likely the case that you have always assumed that Jacob was Jewish. This was certainly the case for myself and most people I know who have supported Jacob Prash and Moriel Ministries, and for good reason. As we can see before us, the very title of the ministry is Moriel Ministries. Moriel, of course, a Hebrew word meaning God is my teacher. There's a Star of David with an open Bible and a menorah prominent in the entire logo. Everything about Moriel Ministries screams Jewish. Here's a different rendition of their logo, the Star of David and the menorah. As you can see, Moriel Ministries, God is my teacher. There's even Hebrew letters here uh, imprinted on the uh, Bible there. This is no big secret. Uh, Jacob is uh, billed by others, even as a Jew, in this old uh, uh, series from Prophecy Depot Ministries, when he was working with uh, David Hawking. As you can see, it says, two Messianic Jews. They go on to mention David Hawking and Jacob Prash. Tackle the tough questions facing Israel today. So Jacob is billed here as a Messianic Jew, which presumably he never corrected and was all too happy to be billed as such. He is described on Moriel's own website here. As in the second uh, underline, we see Jacob is a Hebrew-speaking evangelist to the Jews. This is how he is billed. He is an evangelist to the Jews, and everybody knows He speaks Hebrew. Of course, up top it says, Jacob's family is a combination of Roman Catholic and Jewish. In his youth, he was forced to attend a Catholic school, but also attended the Jewish community center. The distinct impression given here for decades is that Jacob's biological family is Catholic and Jewish. His mother being Irish Catholic, and his father, of course, being Jewish. This is what most people that I know have assumed was always the case. Well, we're going to get into that momentarily, but we're going to begin with this last portion. Jacob is a Hebrew-speaking evangelist to the Jews. And over the course of the years, Jacob has taken uh, many and every opportunity to reinforce this point, that he speaks Hebrew, which is Uh, a rare thing um, for a non-Jew to speak Hebrew. Of course, Jacob has lived in Israel. Uh, His wife, of course, uh, is Israeli, and uh, he often talks about their children being born in Galilee. This is all true. But Jacob will contrive reasons to pray in Hebrew uh, to reinforce this point. Um, There's no reason to do this except as a something of a party trick. These are in American congregations where the likelihood of anybody there speaking Hebrew is pretty near zero, outside of Jacob himself. So this is intended to be a show, right? What profit profit is it to anybody hearing you speak in another language if they don't understand what you're saying? There's a whole chapter in our Bible about, about this, right? So... 
um, we speak with the understanding. So that's, you're seeing a show here, but just to understand the image that has been projected for years, very clearly one that uh, Jacob is a Jewish man, at least half Jewish. Let's listen. At any event, the sun will be going down in several hours. It will be the Jewish Sabbath. So, I think today is Friday, isn't it? Yeah. So, we'll pray in Hebrew. Eloheinu Moshienu, Amak to the Tzim Lavo Bifnecha Od Pam Abba, Amak to Mevakshim Mimcha, Sheyata Teadriko Tana Bidakecha. And I've already been notified if I fail to pray in Hebrew, somebody's going to get angry, so I have to keep everybody happy. He does this often. Well, somebody told me I have to pray in Hebrew. Well, let's concoct a reason to pray in Hebrew. This is all a show. This is, uh, this is a brag. This is a display of, look what I know. But do is also. Okay. Jacob speaks Hebrew. Um, in this particular video, notice how they titled it, Women at the Well, Jacob Prash, Hebrew-speaking Jewish evangelist. This is how I myself characterized him at a time. I assumed he was Jewish because... That is exactly the impression he wanted to give. It was a false impression. It has been a rather false impression for the better part of three decades, if not more. Now the first sentence here. Jacob's family is a combination of Irish Catholic and Jewish. In his youth, he was forced to attend a Catholic school, but he also attended the Jewish Community Center. Take a listen, and we'll unpack this. Now again, if somebody said this, they might sound anti-Semitic. I assure you, I am not anti-Semitic. My family are Israeli Jews. It's family. Hello, dear friends. My name is Jacob Prask, and it's wonderful to be with you today. I'd like to share something with our Jewish friends, people from Jewish backgrounds, from the Jewish faith. My own family is a mixture of Jew and Gentile. Family. Growing up in New York, I went both to a Catholic school and the Jewish community center. I was both baptized, sprinkled as an infant, but circumcised as a baby. As a kid growing up in the New York area, I went to a Catholic school and the Jewish community center. As some of you know, I was both sprinkled and clipped. <laughs> I was forced by my mother to go to a Catholic school. And I was sent by my father to a Jewish community center. I was both sprinkled and clipped. <laughs> this is the running introduction with Jacob Prash and Moriel. My family are a combination of Irish Catholic and Jewish. My mother forced me to go to Catholic school. My father forced me to go to the Jewish community center. And then he says, I was both sprinkled and clipped. Now, he's referring to two religious rites or religious ceremonies. He's not using clipped or circumcision in the context of some custom in America, but in the distinct context of there being some Jewish background in his family. And he is deliberately equivocating with the term family. The term family has two distinct definitions here, which he has done for years. It is pretty masterful, to be honest, the equivocation. What he is saying is very technically true, so he could never be called to the carpet on it. When he says, my family are a combination of uh, Irish Catholic and Jewish, he's making a reference to his biological family, his mother being of Irish descent and presumably his father, and his married family, namely his wife and children. His wife is indeed Jewish, but that is not the context that he's giving here. The impression is that his background, his biological background growing up was a Jewish background. And when he says, I was sprinkled and clipped, 
right after, right on the heels of saying, I went to the Catholic school and the Jewish community center, the distinct impression is that he went through two different religious rites. This is important. My family background. Pay close attention here again. The Jewish faith. My own family is a mixture of Jew and Gentile. Growing up in New York, I went both to a Catholic school and the Jewish community center. So he says, my family are a mixture of Jew and Gentile, and then immediately proceeds to tell you about growing up, how he went to the Catholic school and the Jewish community center. That is the only family that would be in your mind, his biological family, his mother and his father. This is equivocation on such a grand scale. The family that is Jewish is his married family. He married a Jewish woman. But as we're going to see, there's a lot going on here. This has been his standard introduction for the better part of 30 years, if not more. I was sprinkled and clipped. I went through a religious passage in the Catholic Church and a religious passage in a Jewish synagogue. That is the very clear and undeniable impression that he has given deliberately. In this article here on Moriel, entitled Questions for Jewish People. You can see Jacob introduces himself up here. Shalom, my name is Yaakov, hyphen Jacob, right? This is a, a Jewish rendition of the name Jacob. His name is James. Uh, in any event, he will refer to himself as Yaakov. My name's Joshua. I, I don't refer to myself as Yeshua or Hosea or any variation of that that would sound Jewish. I just call myself Joshua. This is deliberate. It's, again, designed to give you the impression that there is a Jewish uh, background. Now, we're going to continue here. He says... Uh, in the second paragraph there. I know Jewish people are revolted by Jews who believe in Jesus. So you can rest assured my mother is a Gentile Roman Catholic. Again, he's distinguishing his mother as a Gentile, but then says nothing about his father. The natural deduction is, oh, his father must be the Jewish counterpart. He's got a, Jew, uh, a Gentile mother and a Jewish father. She doesn't believe what I believe, but I'm not halakhically Jewish. My wife and children, however, are. Okay. We'll continue down here for just a moment. He says, as we've seen, look at now I grew up in the New York area and I was sent both to a Roman Catholic school and the Jewish community center. And he says, I had... Brit Mala. Plus, I was sprinkled as a baby. Now we see a variation of the standard introduction. I was sprinkled and clipped. Only this time, we've entered some new territory. Um, just to back up a moment, I know Jewish people are revolted by Jews who believe in Jesus. So you can rest assured my mother is a Gentile Roman Catholic. The very clear impression is that he is in some capacity Jewish. And since he distinguishes his mother as not being Jewish, the natural deduction again is, oh, his father must be, uh, he must be half Jewish. But he specifies, I'm not halakhically Jewish. Which uh, reinforces the position that he must therefore be ethnically Jewish. Because halakha is Jewish observation the way a Jew would go, observation of Jewish law. There are many different approaches to halakha, so this is a pretty involved topic by itself, but generally speaking, it is an observation of Jewish law in some capacity. So when he says, I'm not halakhically Jewish, what he's saying is, I'm not observantly Jewish, why would he make that distinction? Unless to give the clear impression that I am ethnically Jewish, I'm just not halakhically Jewish. 
Because if somebody weren't Jewish at all, they would just say, I'm not Jewish, right? I would just say, I'm not Jewish. If I told you I'm not halakhically Jewish, you would be right in assuming, oh, he must, he must have some Jewish DNA, but he's not an observant Jew in any capacity. It's exactly what's happening here. But again, he says, I was sprinkled as a baby, right? He went to the Roman Catholic school and the Jewish community center. I had Brit Malah and I was sprinkled. Okay, before he just said, I was sprinkled and clipped. But Brit Malah is a very specific ceremonial induction into the Jewish faith. To invoke the term Brit Malah is to not just give an impression anymore, but to basically claim to have been identified in, in ritual Judaism with a ritual circumcision. Bris or Brit Malah, according to Jewish law, a healthy baby boy is circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. I'm sure we're all familiar with this. This is not a reference to a cultural uh, practice in America, which is common in hospitals. If it was, Jacob would have had no reason to say, I was circumcised as a result of being born in America, where most males are circumcised just as a custom in, in America. He says, Brit Malah. This is something completely different. This isn't just your run-of-the-mill circumcision in the hospital. This is a ceremony. You can see Brit Malah, the ritual ceremony. Down here it says uh, it, it'll take place in the home or synagogue and marks the identification of a baby boy as a Jew. That's what Brit Malah is, which is interestingly part of Halakha, which Jacob says he is not. He is not halakhically uh, Jewish, but he says that he had Brit Malah, which is part of Halakha. The ceremony is traditionally conducted by a moil, etc., etc. It is a joyous occasion for parents. This is not circumcision as most men in, in America uh, have as just a result of being born in your average hospital. On this website here, of uh, Jewish museum.org, you can see the uh, Brit Malah is the ceremony during which a circumcision is performed on Jewish uh, baby boys when they are eight days old. The ceremony is important to many Jewish people as it is a symbol of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Watch as this family shares what they think the ceremony, sorry, why they think the ceremony of Brit Malah is important. Let's listen. Again, this is a ceremony, an official religious ceremony known as Brit Malah, Jacob says that he had. Listen. The biblical origins of uh, the bris mila are the covenant, which is a contract um, between okay. God and Abraham and between God and the Jewish people, which we still enter into today. The day we gave our son his bris mila um, was a difficult day. It was quite emotional, but it was important to us that we pass on the Jewish identity to him, to the next generation. And that was the day that we gave him his Jewish identity. That was the day we gave him his name. As the Mohel performs the circumcision, the father recites the following blessing. Into the covenant, sins, amen. Just as he's entered into the covenant, so may he enter into the Torah, the marriage canopy, and good deeds. And that is the first stage in a Jewish boy's life. Yeah. Our hope is that he'll grow up to be a good Jew and that in, in future he'll build his own home and be able to pass on our values and Jewish values to his own children. Brit Malah is part of very specific Jewish identity. As he says, it's the first stage in a Jewish boy's life. Moreover, this must be conducted by a Jew. There are very few, if any, Jewish circles that would allow a Gentile to perform the circumcision, the, the role of the moil. So this is a very formal Jewish ceremony. Jacob says, I had Brit Milah in an article written directed at Jews in which he introduces himself as Yaakov. There's no mistaking what he's claiming here. He was sent to a Roman Catholic school in the Jewish community center and had Brit Milah. Certainly, he must have been inducted into the Jewish faith in some capacity, else he would have just said, he wouldn't have even mentioned circumcision, but he's mentioning it, mentioning it in the context of religion. 
which in America, circumcisions at hospitals have nothing to do with that. This is a, just a cultural custom at this point. Brit Mala is a ceremony. This is either true or it isn't. Who conducted this Brit Mala? Okay. Jacob uses this interesting phrase here saying, so I'm speaking to you as a Jewish person. Now, this can be read two ways, and it was deliberately constructed to be read that way. Of course, what he would say is, well, I was saying the whole article is directed to a Jew, so I'm speaking to you who is a Jewish person. But this is a bit of an ambiguous statement, and absolutely can be, and was intended to be read also as, I'm speaking to you as a Jew. Of, of, of course, the whole uh, impression, the entire article is that he's Jewish. I'm speaking to you as a Jew as well, right? Well, these are all the very clear impressions that everybody has just assumed for years. Jacob was Jewish. And when f- allegations first arose that Jacob was not Jewish because of the source they were emanating from, they are things that I ignored. I thought this was just another hit piece, just some attack on Jacob. Much like the financial issues that we've looked at, I started looking into this after realizing that there were these other massive problems. And unfortunately, it appears that those who said Jacob was lying about being Jewish all these years were in fact correct. Now, another brother uh, who we've already read some from wrote this uh, email in uh, July, on July 19th, I believe it was. Again, supported Moriel for years. And here's one of the things he says in that email. There is another item that has concerned me that hopefully can be addressed more clearly. I thought the presentation that Jacob made to prove his Jewish ancestry, and he provides a link, was poorly presented, and I'm concerned it may have been more confusing than clarifying to those who have seen it. Indeed, it was. This presentation was one of the things that made me question it. It was so poorly presented. For example... The sheet that was presented didn't show the percentage of Jewish ancestry, but instead a boilerplate migration map. The other sheet showing DNA origin percentages should have been presented. I know this because I have my DNA report from the same company. At best, the DNA video was incompetently presented. Presenting it more competently would remove any lingering doubt, deny Moriel's detractors this avenue of attack, and alleviate any confusion. This point was completely sidestepped by the entire Moriel board entirely. What is he referencing? For those that don't know, while the claims made in this article and over the years in various books, his presentation, the constant reference to Hebrew, he was dipped and clipped, all of those are very distinct presentation, but Jacob ups the ante in a presentation about his DNA. Now there's no room for ambiguity whatsoever. Pay attention. This is in response to allegations made by Chris Rosebro and others that there was some question about his ancestry. Something wasn't right. Now, what else you want to see? How about my DNA? Let's DNA. look at my DNA. Signed by a geneticist, a genetic biologist, dated Jacob Prash, DNA. I don't want you to see my number. However, Ireland is up here. If you don't know what's on the other side of Great Britain opposite Scotland and Wales, that's... This is only Y chromosome, it is only paternal. The Hazar Empire, of course, converted to Judaism and immigrated into Eastern Europe and intermarried with the Jewish community. As you see, my DNA came from the Middle East and merged with the Hazar DNA. Even gives the percentages 12% 12% hazard, 38%, etc. Now, this is only the Y chromosome. It's my father. My mother is 110%, well, nearly all Irish and a little bit Scandinavian. That's me. The fact that. 
if you're confused, you're in good company. There's nobody seeing that that wasn't more confused afterward than they were before. There are these cuts, there, there's this map that is shown with a bunch of arrows, and he's explaining the Hazar Empire, doesn't show you any percentages, doesn't show you anything that even remotely indicates that he's Jewish. He just says, look, my name's up here, and here's a bunch of arrows, and this has to do with the Hazar Empire, and my DNA merged with it. Uh, incompetent is an understatement. It's actually deceptive. Deliberately so. Pay attention. Oh, yes. By the way, I was circumcised, but I'm not going to show you the proof of that. You'll have to take my word for it. Again, he brings up circumcision in the context of defending his Jewishness, right? So, school. listen. But my mother sent me to a Catholic school. At the behest of my father, I was sent to a Jewish community center. I was in no way brought up in the Jewish faith or religion. I studied Judaism in Cambridge and at the Gaspari Center in Jerusalem, which is a branch of Cambridge and so forth. I speak Hebrew, my family are Israeli, but my own background was Roman Catholic, primarily due to my mother. In other words, by way of background, yes, I was in the Jewish community, but I was never in the Jewish faith. Well, now we have a bigger problem. Because this isn't about the Jewish community or the Jewish faith, but now we're talking about claims about his own DNA. Uh, but he still says, my family are Israeli. Now again, he's now referring to his married family, not his uh, biological family. Okay? But again, going back, listen to what he says specifically about his DNA. Again, we're not even talking about the, the faith or the community. But his DNA now. Jacob Prash, DNA. I don't want you to see my number. However, Ireland is up here. If you don't know what's on the other side of Great Britain, opposite Scotland and Wales, that's. This is only Y chromosome. It is only paternal. So again, he's just talking about his father. Again, there's this this impression about his father. The Hazar Empire, of course, converted to Judaism and immigrated into Eastern Europe and intermarried with the Jewish community. As you see, my DNA came from the Middle East and merged with the Chazer DNA. Even gives the percentages. 12% Hazer, 38%, etc. 12% Hazer, but he keeps talking about the intermarrying with the Jewish people. That's where his DNA came from. And this is all a lie. Demonstrably, that same brother who sent them the letter in July followed up on August 7th. We've already talked about some of his recommendations in the previous section that they ignored completely, not even so much as a response to this letter, which begins, Dear Jacob Prash and Moriel Ministries board members and administrators, the following steps would go a long way toward addressing the concerns recently raised by friends of Moriel, not enemies. People who have supported Moriel in every possible way were raising, were having concerns about this. Not Chris Rosebro, not anybody else. People who were still currently supporting Jacob were growing concerned. Taking these steps would show good faith by Jacob and the board before the body of Christ. Now, he puts board in quotes because there's we still don't have um, a clear understanding of who the board is or exactly what their duties are. As you can see, the long list of abuses that they've allowed to happen under their watch from uh, embezzlement to the commissioning of fake websites with pornographic material on it, etc., um, begs the question, exactly what is the board doing besides enabling Jacob? the unsaved world who is now watching, and most importantly, before our Lord Jesus. Okay, one of those recommendations was this. Show the percentage of Jewish DNA listed in Jacob's iGenie DNA report. Replying to this email with an attachment containing the full documentation from iGenie would be easy. 
I have attached mine as an example of what could easily be done. Why not simply do the same? As I stated in my recent letter to some of the Moriel board members and administrators, this would also alleviate so much of the pressure and add so much clarity. Here's what the actual DNA sheet from iGenie looks like, because they send you three documents. The actual DNA percentage sheet that Jacob did not show is this. This brother had his DNA done by the exact same company. So this is as fair a comparison as possibly imaginable. It's from the exact same company. As you can see, the percentages are very clearly listed. American Indian from Central and South America, 23%. American Indian, North America, 8%. Greece and Balkans, etc., etc. If Jacob wanted to confirm his Jewish ancestry, certainly he would have shown these percentages in clear cut language. What he showed was this paper, which we can see side by side with this other brother's, is identical. Why is it identical? Because everybody receives the exact same map from iGenie. This is not the DNA percentages. This is uh, the origins of mankind migration map. They are identical. Look, they're in the exact same location. The arrows go the same way. Everybody gets this paper. There are these blue arrows. There's the long red arrow and, and the green arrows. Now, let's listen again to what Jacob says about this. As you can see, already quite deceptive. Why would he show this map instead of this one? This is the only DNA percentage map they sent him, and that's the one he didn't show while talking about his DNA. Well, he did this on purpose. Listen. The Khazar Empire, of course, converted to Judaism and immigrated into Eastern Europe. And in I'm going to pause it for a moment. moment. He's talking about the Khazar Empire again. Okay. As you can see at the bottom of your screen, it shows 50% and 18%. So 50% of this red arrow, 18% of this green arrow, but there's nothing listed there. Why does it, 50% what? What does the red indicate? Well, Jacob had that deleted on purpose because it would conflict with the lie that he's telling right here. The married with the Jewish community. As you see, my DNA... We don't see. We don't see anything because it was concealed deliberately. Came from the Middle East mm -hmm. and merged with the Khazar DNA. That is not what that it, map means. It, listen, it even gives the percentages, he says. It even gives the percentages. 12% Khazar, 38%, etc. Here's what it actually looks like. The, uh, here's the other brother's map. You know what those arrows mean? The blue one means Indo-European. Red means hunter-gatherer. Gray means non-European, and green means farmer. So using this legend, let's go back to Jacob's paper, which shows 50% of red. Red means hunter-gatherer. So 50% hunter-gatherer. You see 18% green. Green means farmer. This is just talking about the type of people group that he came from. This is not the DNA. So he says, as you can see, it gives the percentages, 12% Hazer, listen. It even gives the percentages, 12% Hazer, 38%, etc. 12% Hazer, 38%, etc. Hazer is not one of the words listed on this paper, which is exactly why Jacob had them blotted out. Notice, 35% green, it says farmer, 24% hunter-gatherer. Jacob's is blank, 50% blank with no indication of what. Because if Jacob had 50% hunter-gatherer here, it would contradict his narrative. 18% farmer. This is not the DNA chart. Jacob lied on purpose. Again, this is the DNA chart. It shows the regions and exact percentages of where you came from. But this company, iGenie, has a specific section on Judaism on their website. Jewish Roots. DNA origins and analysis. Special attention to detail given to those who are Jewish. DNA origins analysis. Are you Jewish? 
Let's read it together, straight from their website. Do you have Jewish roots? Are you Ashkenazi? Are you a Levi or a Cohen? A DNA test by iGenie provides you with clear evidence, clear, of whether you have Jewish roots. Based on your specific genetic characteristics, we can identify whether you are of Jewish descent. Which line of Jewish descent uh, the Jewish descent is from, paternal, maternal, or both lines, that's how good this is, and even to what percentage you are Jewish. In addition, your profile is compared with more than 700,000 people in our database. If we find a genetic match, that is, uh, people who you correspond genetically, you may contact these people and intensify your family research. So they give very specific results about just how Jewish you are and just what uh, uh, lineage of uh, Jew you come from. That's how good their test is. Jacob shows the map that has nothing to do with the DNA and erases the words that say hunter-gatherer and farmer and does not show the actual map, which would have looked something like this. And if he were Jewish, here's what it would look like, straight from the company's own website. It would have said, Jewish diaspora, something like this, 47% Ashkenazi or Levi, or whatever. It would have specifically said Jewish diaspora. Now, if Jacob's whole goal and aim in invoking his DNA was to clarify the Jewish ancestry of his father, which he did, go back and watch the whole video, the 666 virtue of Chris Rosebro, it is unfathomable that Jacob would not have included the only document from that company that shows the actual percentage of his DNA. Instead, he shows the generic migratory map that everybody receives and then blocked out the words which said hunter-gatherer and farmer as those weren't to do with his DNA. This is. It would have said exactly how much Middle Eastern DNA he had. According to them, it would have told them whether the DNA was paternal or maternal and the exact percentage, and it would have said Jewish diaspora. There is no possible way that Jacob would not have shown this. If he was even 30% Jewish, he would have said, look, there you can see for yourself, 30% Jewish diaspora. What do you want from me? My father's mostly Jewish. I'm about half Jewish. That's it. I didn't grow up in the Jewish faith, <clears throat> but my father's background was Jewish. That's, that's all it is. This is a silly thing to lie about. He never had to lie about it. He does speak Hebrew. But Jacob has proven to be a habitual liar about nearly everything, including his very identity to the better part of three decades. Jacob lied about being Jewish. He did it deliberately. Apparently, he did this as s some marketing uh, point. He says in his own book here, one of several, Israel, the Church, and the Jews— Remember, he constantly mentions his circumcision, even saying, I was circumcised, but I'm not going to show you that, in the context of, is he Jewish or not? In his book here, he's talking about the types of, what constitutes a Jew. There is the halakhic one set up by the Jewish religious law. According to halakhic law, remember, Jacob in the article says, I, I'm not halakhically Jewish. According to halakhic law, it would be by matriarchal descent, mother's side. If your mother was Jewish, or if you underwent a halakhic conversion to Judaism, in other words, circumcision, then you would get patriarchal inclusion if your mother was Jewish. Notice what he says here, halakhic conversion to Judaism, in other words, circumcision. So when he says, I had Brit Malah, which is the formal ritual circumcision in uh, Halakhic Judaism, he is saying that he did have that formal in induction as a Jewish boy. But in the same breath, he says, I wasn't Halakhically Jewish. Jacob's just playing around with words left and right. He has given not just a false impression for years, that was bad enough. But then when he started claiming that his background was uh, Jewish DNA, 
Then he showed a migratory map and deliberately blocked out the words hunter, gatherer, and farmer so you wouldn't catch on to his lies. You can see that this man lies like it's his second nature. He lied about the spoof websites. He's lied about finances. He lied about not receiving a salary. He has lied about so much right down to his very identity and has critiqued others for not remaining in the state in which God called them, for people giving, uh, being too philo-Semitic in, in some uh, instances, elevating Jewishness above Jesusness, as he often says. He's right about all the claims. He's just a liar because he has he does ceremonies at uh, many of his conferences. He's talk, welcoming in the Sabbath, do, wearing a yarmulke, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Jacob is not Jewish. If he were, he would have shown you the one paper from that company that would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jacob does, in fact, have Jewish DNA. He didn't show you that because it's not there. He didn't think anybody would use such an obscure company as Igeni, but lo, another brother who has supported Moriel for years did use it and disclosed what should have been shared, even implored Jacob privately on August 7th to please share this. Look how easy it is to share this. Jacob didn't even respond. Why? Because if he showed you the actual DNA percentages, it would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is not Jewish. Right down to his very identity, Jacob has lied about pretty much everything. And the people that have supported him in these lies, again include Divorce Truth with Marco Quintana. Go now and unsubscribe from that channel. John Haller from Fellowship Bible Chapel. Go now and unsubscribe from that channel. Dean Gibson. Go now and unsubscribe from that channel. And absolutely go now and unsubscribe from Moriel Ministries. A sham from start to finish. Astoundingly standing on so much good doctrine. It's mind-blowing. This is what is so hard for most people to compute. How can there be so many true things and it be so bad? How can the behavior be, how could there be so many lies and yet so much truth in a doctrinal sense? I am as confounded as many of you. And this is what has made so many people reluctant to accept this very difficult reality. It is admittedly confusing. But at this point, it is absolutely undeniable. Again, Jacob Prash is not alone disqualified from ministry, but is to be disfellowshipped. Per 1 Corinthians chapter 5, not even to eat with such a person, barring again some monumental public repentance. He has obfuscated, equivocated, used ambiguous language for decades to give the false impression that he was Jewish when he was not. To the extent that when these allegations resurfaced about a year ago, he brought his wife on for about five different Bible studies over the course of a couple of weeks to do this um, Hebrew teaching where she translated for him in Hebrew. This was an impressions game. She is Israeli. Her parents apparently were Holocaust survivors. Jacob did live in Israel, but he's not Jewish. He learned Hebrew. He knows a lot about Judaism. But he claims he had Brit Malah as a child, official Jewish rite of passage. He claims his DNA is Jewish, merged with Jewish DNA, and then failed to show it because it was a lie. But he has given every impression deliberately that he was Jewish And he wasn't. Those who call themselves Jews and are not, but lie. After seeing all the other undeniable lies and deceptions, a pill that has been very hard to swallow, and the big 
menorah in the middle of the room, as it were, for many who support Moriel, maybe now you can come to terms with just how bad this is on every possible level. We're now going to get into some brief rebuttals and conclude. Do me a big favor. Please do me a favor. Do yourselves a bigger one. If you see this pattern in Jacob Prash, please come and tell me. But come to me quickly that I can put it right before it's too late. Because once this pattern gains momentum, there's no stopping it. It takes on an inertia of its own. Well, the evidence is in, and it is sadly irrefutable. From cyber fraud, the issuing of fake websites to harass and antagonize enemies, to the creation of bogus Facebook pages impersonating a rape victim to harass another victim, to financial corruption, embezzlement, conspiracy to cover up that embezzlement, so-called bonuses that appear to be hush money for board members to a near 30-year-long lie about being Jewish. The corruption is utterly staggering and hard to believe. But here we are to conclude these matters. What has happened in the aftermath of all of this brings us to this conclusion, to the pattern of Saul and the signatures of Satan, things Jacob Prash himself has taught about. You are going to see that Jacob Prash himself is now a case study in both of those teachings as is the rest of the Moriel board and all of the men you see here pictured, John Haller, Marco Quintana, Sandy Simpson, David Lister, and Blair Waugh of the Moriel Canadian Division. So what has happened in the aftermath of this? Well, it's pretty staggering, and we're going to begin with um, what we concluded with in the previous video, which was this... Uh, death threat. Remember, this veiled death threat. The circumstantial evidence was so overwhelming that Jacob Prash and his friend Charles Jardin were behind it that it would be um, quite ignorant and supremely naive to consider anything else. And uh, we're, I'm going to refresh your memory if this happens to be the... Um, If you haven't seen the first video yet, I strongly recommend you watch it. But here's the comment sent December 11th, 2020, directed to a woman that Jacob loathes with his innermost being uh, named Deborah Menelaus. Okay. Hello, Deborah. You fat, smelly, mutant tuna fish, stinking, AIDS-ridden, unwanted piece of garbage. Just had a look through your vile websites. Not impressed, I must say. This is because you don't even have the strength to put your name on your vile juvenile post that wouldn't merit the attention of a chimpanzee. Anyways, pleasure as always. I guess you're still living in that pish-stained dump of a place through in Scotland's unwanted zone, East Coast, namely Fife. I may actually come through one night and pay you a visit, in quotes. Ah, yes. Anyway, needless to say, I will now be moderating your post. Remember this, you may hide behind a fake alias. Alas, so am I. Nevertheless, I can get to you any time. Speak soon, you fat waste of space. Tell that plank face hubby I was thinking of him and the kids. Oh, wait, you don't have any. One of the more disgusting things I've ever read, uh, even by worldly standards. This is not alone disgusting, but uh, would probably be classed as terroristic in nature, um, uh, harassing and a veiled death threat, saying that they might come through and pay a visit to her, in quotes. 
and saying that they can get at her any time. Well, the circumstantial evidence pointing to Jacob Prash and his accomplice, Charles Jardin, was overwhelming. We now have a first-hand eyewitness in um, the former Moriel volunteer and former John Haller comment moderator, Linda McIntyre. After my video was posted, she sent this email October 9th. 2021, she says, thank you for saying you believed me that I would never email Deborah that garbage. That meant a lot to me. My husband listened also and also had his eyes opened. Jacob threw me under the bus. I stopped speaking to Jacob or anyone else in Moriel eight weeks ago after I found out that Jacob, uh, Charles and Jacob wrote that email to Deb. Deb and I are friends, she says. Jacob made Charles apologize to me, but I was furious when they told me what they did. And basically, I told Charles and Jacob to never contact me again. Charles hates me. His hatred of me is well known throughout the Moriel camp, etc., etc. She says, I found out what they did, and they told me what they did regarding this nasty email to Deb. Deb. Um, I wanted to make sure we were on the same page, so I asked her to clarify. She responded with this, The nasty, dirty one that Jacob and Charles blamed me for calling Deb tuna-smelling, etc. The veiled death threat we just read. She says, I finally saw that nasty email to Deb on Power Play Pause. She's using the term email, but she means this comment. That's why I wanted clarification. It's a it's a technical point, but that's what she's referencing. Uh, she says, I was shocked. I told my husband I didn't do it, and at that time, I didn't know it was Charles and Jacob. My husband asked to read it. My husband is a full-blooded Scotsman from Glasgow. He came to America 14 years ago. His name's Peter McIntyre. Peter read it. He said, this was not written by you, Linda. I can see that. The slang and vulgar language is Scottish. I didn't even know what she meant to write pish was. This is a distinctly Scottish slang term. Peter went on. Uh, he read it all. His summation was this. The letter was written by a male. The male is just above middle class. It was written by a person living in Scotland, but not born in Scotland. Some terms were only said by the English, not Scots, and some were true Scottish insults. The tuna part is a strict Scottish slang. English do not use it. The one person that fits this to a T, Charles. Did Charles know Deb personally? Yes. They have been to each other's homes many times for meals. I was shocked. These people said they loved me and valued me. I gave my husband's report to the Moriel board, to Charles and Jacob. Thus, the apology, which I did not accept, I felt used and violated. So Linda McIntyre submitted a report to the entire Moriel board. We're not even sure exactly who the board is, uh, but... It at least includes uh, Jacob, Dave Lister, Marco Quintana, and possibly Blair Waugh. John Haller being their lawyer and uh, uh, legal advisor, uh, it's very likely that he knew about this. Linda's a personal friend of his, and in fact, I've copied John Haller in responses to this email, so he absolutely knows about it now. John Haller knows now that Linda is a witness to Jacob and Charles admitting to this terroristic, veiled death threat, and John Haller, Moriel's lawyer and so-called prophecy expert, has said nothing. Given this new evidence, this uh, will likely be submitted to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, uh, here in America. Um, it is already under investigation by the UK Cybercrimes Division, but as the uh, threat itself is terroristic in nature, it is a veiled death threat, and it is coupled with uh, habitual cyber fraud activity, etc., by, by a worldwide so-called ministry organization, um, a report is going to be filed for investigation, and I will be... Uh, I will not be surprised to see criminal charges come of this to the extent, again, that Jacob Prash and his accomplice Charles Jardin or and or any of the men pictured here have broken the law. To that extent, they need to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of it. This is monumental, people. This is not just bad. This is grotesque and apparently criminal. 
this is where we stand. This is the first big breakthrough in the aftermath of my video from just over a week ago. Confirmation now, an admission from Jacob and Charles that they were in fact behind the veiled death threat to Deborah Menelaus. Then a fake website, a fake YouTube channel emerged, Servetus Christi, I was told by several people, have you seen this? There's a fake website, somebody impersonating you. Um, this has been reported by several people. YouTube should be investigating it as we speak. Um, I suggest you report this as well. Um, this website emerged. Uh, I knew immediately who was behind it, um, as we saw in the last video. The habitual business of Jacob and his accomplice, Charles Jardin, is to create fake websites, fake uh, channels of various descriptions from Facebook to BitChute to YouTube, etc. What they do is lurk in the shadows. Uh, they stole my logos and are now impersonating me with doctored videos of me and so forth. Well... Their own uh, RTN TV mailing list, the so-called Remnant Truth Network, sent out this email to their entire mailing list. If you're on it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it said, Only facts matter. Joshua Chavez from Service Christi Ministries looks at the irrefutable evidence against Jacob Prash featuring Amos Farrell. And it provides some links. And there was a link to one of these videos here. Now, this is their own RTN mailing list. Okay. Um, somebody on Moriel's uh, YouTube channel says this. On his video, people are telling him somebody has posted a YouTube channel and RTN TV channel in his name. He claims it was Charles Jardin at Jacob's behest, in Joshua's own words. Yes, I did say that. Basically, he's claiming that Moriel is creating these accounts, impersonating him as the author in the comments, and he's telling people to take screenshots and report them. Yes, I did. So I think it's either Joshua himself doing these things uh, and pretending it's not him or one of his followers doing it to try to make Jacob look bad and Joshua not being aware, or maybe he is aware of that. This is ridiculous. These videos are mocking me. Um, Moriel responds, yeah, that's what we think too. We're pretty certain Joshua himself created the spoof Facebook pages, and other fake websites. We're almost certain he made the YouTube page too. As to how it got linked on RTN, we're looking into it. It's down now, thankfully. Uh, this is so preposterous. I I'm just shocked to, to see how... Uh, I'm, I'm just shocked to see this. I can't believe they would say something so patently dumb. It is really a dumb thing to say. We're pretty certain. Look what they're doing. They're not only trying to blame me for creating a spoof site against myself, which mocks me. They're also trying to blame me for creating all the fake websites that we saw irrefutable evidence that Jacob and Charles were behind. This is how desperate Moriel has become. The very pattern of Saul emerging in Jacob and Moriel, as we're going to see. They continue responding to another person. Um, that's exactly what we're trying. Notice they said here, though, uh, we don't know how it got linked on RTN. They're playing dumb about how it got on their own, their own mailing list. I'll tell you how it got there. They did it. As we've already seen, this is what they do. They continue, we're, this is what we're trying to figure out. We're quite certain the producer of the spoof site was either Joshua himself or one of our subs made it as a joke. So look how uncertain they are. We're quite certain that we don't know what we're talking about. We're quite certain it was either Josh or one of our own subscribers. This is how ridiculous their suppositions are. Doing it as a joke, real funny. If that's the case, it only speaks to the rotten fruit of the subscribers of Moriel. Remember, Jesus said when the Pharisees made converts, they were twice as much a son of hell as themselves. So it is with many of the Jacobites. As for RTN, our working theory is that someone there thought it was humorous and posted it on their site. 
We have no idea why they would do that, and we contacted them about it. That's why it's been removed. We have no control to upload anything onto their site. But since we asked, they did remove it. Now, understand, RTN is not entirely and wholly distinct and separate from Moriel. As we saw in the financial portion, RTN TV is a registered limited liability company with David Lister, Moriel board member and secretary, as the president with their servers or their base there in Austin, Texas. It is operated by Charles Jardin, who is Jacob's accomplice, but they are always trying to have an out or, or distance themselves to remain um, to avoid any culpability. So they try to act like RTN is some distinct entity, which it's not. So they think, oh, maybe somebody thought it was humorous and posted it. We don't know. Somebody, as far as I know, Charles Jardin is the lone operator of RTN, as far as I know. But somebody from the private Facebook group, the RTN TV Fellowship Group, this is a private group of which I am not a member, sent me this screenshot. This is, as you can see, doctored logos. They, they changed the name Servetus Christi. Real unoriginal. And it is posted by Charles Jardin himself. Charles Jardin, operator and apparent you know, owner, or at least co-owner of RTN TV. He's the one that posted it in the private Facebook group. As you can see, this is not a YouTube link. This is rtntv.org. This is uploaded to their own server. So what's the working theory there now? Charles Jardin posted it. Clearly, he doctored all of this as he did all of the other, however many, eight, ten fake websites and different channels, bogus Facebook pages that we saw in the previous video. And if you look at the YouTube channel, the title of the video, Service Christie Examining the Evidence and Giving the Facts Against Moriel. And then we look at the title of this, Service Christie Examining the Evidence and Giving the Facts Against Moriel. It's the same video. Charles Jardin, at Jacob's behest, created yet another fake spoof site to mock and harass me. These men lurk in the shadows, but Moriel didn't stop there. Watch this gaslighting spin doctoring manipulation yeah we saw that last night says moriel tv we believe it's another one of josh's spoof sites called servetus christi they're actually accusing me of spoofing myself watch it's on youtube you can see it for yourself it's obviously his next play he's very unoriginal He'll come out with another round of emails rebuking us and demanding repentance for spoofing sites, uh, for spoofing his sites this time, and concoct some list of questions that we'll not respond to, and then release another video with his irrefutable proofs that we didn't learn to repent, and yada, yada, yada. He's already began sending emails to our board members trying to solicit some kind of response for more ammunition. Whatever. We're done with it. Let him attack. We no longer care. These men are on a rampage. You're watching uh, actions that are akin to a headless chicken. They literally created another spoof YouTube channel, went so far as doctoring the whole, all the logos, uploading it to their own RTN server. Charles Jardin uploads it to a private uh, Facebook group. They send it to their entire email list and then try to blame me for doing it. Because someone at RTN thought it was humorous or thought it was a joke. That's their working theory. And then they uh, suppose that this is my next play. Oh, Josh did this and he's trying to blame us for it. This is literally what they're doing. They did this and they're trying to blame me for it. These men are out of their collective minds. And it only further proves everything from the first video. They couldn't stop themselves. They just couldn't. And then, in their desperation, are trying to blame me uh, uh, as creating this so I could blame them for doing it. The levels of manipulation and gaslighting here are nothing short of satanic. It is the very pattern of Saul. Jacob Prash rebukes himself. Even confronted with irrefutable evidence, proof, 
prima facie incrimination. I'm innocent. What about this? Well, it's the people's fault. I didn't do it. Falsely protesting their innocence. They are falsely protesting their innocence. The proof is irrefutable. It was already irrefutable. Then they double down. Linda McIntyre now admitting Jacob and Charles admitted to her and then apologized to her for letting her take the blame for it, that they sent this veiled death threat. Then they create a bogus Facebook page imperson- or YouTube channel impersonating me, send it to their entire RTN people uh, mailing list, upload it to their own servers, and then try to blame me for it. But they also say, well, it was either Josh or one of our subscribers. Staggering. They said in their official response on August 7th, listen, the castigation of the Moriel board for not doing more to restrict Jacob and allow sin begs two questions. What sin? Joshua Chavez insinuates, but where is the sin he only conjectures, which he expects to be accepted as fact? As we've already seen with near, you know, five, six hours of insurmountable proof at this point. The sin is overwhelming. And they knew about all of it and conspired to cover it all up. And yet, they falsely protest their innocence, just like Saul did. After they begin building the monument to themselves, you will see religious narcissism. A religious narcissist is like any other narcissist. They will never take responsibility for their own faults and failures. They will never take responsibility for their own faults and failures. Jacob's initial response on August 3rd to a longtime Moriel supporter who supported them in prayer and financially said he was so disturbed by the letter that I wrote. Jacob's immediate response was, these things he states are not true. And those who know him and me know they are not true. In Jesus, Jacob. Falsely protesting his innocence. Why? Because he's a religious narcissist. A malignant one at that. He will never take responsibility for his own actions. Even when confronted with irrefutable proof, Jacob will continue and has continued falsely protesting his innocence. As has the entire Moriel board, including their lawyer, John Haller. Who are you to question me? You're in rebellion. You're in a spirit of rebellion. Wait a minute. This is not scriptural. I'll tell you what's scriptural. When a leader is no longer hearing from the Lord, they look for an alternative voice to listen to, pretending it is the Lord. God doesn't talk to them anymore. They're no longer hearing from the Lord. It's precisely where we're at. God is not talking to Jacob anymore. He's no longer hearing from the Lord. He's looking for another voice, perhaps his own, and calling it the Lord. You are watching the pattern of Saul unfold before your eyes. These clips should be haunting to you. They should be eerie to hear this, to hear this man preach against himself. The exceeding sinfulness of sin. Look how blinded he is. As blind as Saul was. It is shocking. No longer hearing from the Lord. So much so, so bad is it that his own henchman, his own accomplice, his own uh, co-conspirator in all of these uh, activities, Charles Jardin wrote this email to former board member Amos Farrell in May of this year. This is a few months ago, folks. Pay attention. Jacob's mind does not function laterally the way of logic at times. He assumes too much, and his mind must be running at 100 miles per hour during his teachings. 
I'm not excusing him for behavioral issues, but we need facts. On another point, didn't he just have a go at you? He's also had a go at the Moriel insiders also. Are we dealing with a very ill man? Was he like this in the past? Has lockdown and his inability to travel stuck at home affecting his mind? The question is, what are we really dealing with here? Are all the online attack all the online attacks must drive a person crazy and indeed make you angry? Is this demonic? Are we being dragged into aiding and abetting a demonic attack? Answer? Yes. Charles Jardin, lacking in any morsel of self-awareness, as he has been, uh, notice he wrote this long after he's already created fake websites for Jacob, after he sent this veiled death threat to Deborah Menelaus. Yes, Charles, you have already aided and abetted demonic attacks. And yet Charles, for all of his own corruption, sees in Jacob a, a special measure of it. That's how bad this is. Questioning whether Jacob is ill, whether he's been like this before. Having a go at even other Moriel insiders, Jacob appears to be losing his mind. What does this do to? Well, there may be many contributing factors. Charles says, well, is it is it because of lockdown? Is it because um, he's uh, all of these online attacks? What is it? Is it because Jacob takes uh, oxycodone on a daily basis? As a former heroin addict, that's not something to be dismissed outright. A former Moriel supporter sent an email to Moriel and Jacob after a particular video saying that he appeared to be intoxicated. Jacob was very defensive, hyper-defensive. This brother was not wrong. There was an appearance of that, which was apparently due to Jacob's uh, oxycodone. This is a very powerful opioid. And as a former heroin addict, I wonder if that has any bearing. Again, this cannot just be dismissed outright. Something is happening. Other people can witness this. They've seen it. The behavior is becoming increasingly irrational. That may be a contributing factor. But the main factor here is old-fashioned pride. Religious narcissism. The spirit of a Pharisee. A hypocrite. This is the business Jacob has engaged in. Irrational attacks. When he can't deal with the issues, he will attack you personally. Circumventing the issue by attacking the person. Character assassination. Don't deal with the issue. When the court of Zedekiah could not deny what Jeremiah was saying. They attacked him for saying it. When you see people avoiding the issues by attacking the personality, the devil is speaking through them, cognizantly or otherwise. Which is precisely what Jacob and Moriel have done every step of the way. From August 3rd, when I sent a very heartfelt letter, which if you have not read, please go read it. It's posted on the Service Christie website. I posted it 48 hours later. Jacob's immediate response to this brother Shane was, Joshua has very serious problems personally and doctrinally. Immediately, right out of the gate, tries to attack me personally, circumvent the issues entirely. A 15,000 word heartfelt letter that literal tears were shed in the process of writing. His immediate response, after begging to film a video with me just weeks prior to this, says, I have very serious problems personally and doctrinally. This is bogus. Like he said, when you see this, the devil is speaking through them. So what does Moriel go on to say? My serious doctrinal problems. As to the Service Christi board, there is none. Uh, Joshua Chavez has not normally... Uh, even had a church or has been accountable to no one, yet he, he sets himself up as a self-appointed, self-appointed investigative authority, even making bogus assertions about other people's private business affairs that are none of his business. As we've already seen, those assertions uh, were not bogus. Jacob's were. As a, and a supercritic of churches, 
than he, uh, when he usually has none himself. Notice what it says, usually, normally, he hasn't had any. Um, his life and ministry are fundamentally out of God's order. Um, not only is uh, this a uh, lie, it begs the question, right? Moriel themselves did an entire seven-part series in Canada, which I filmed, called Church for the Churchless. If I had to guess, I I bet approximately 70% of Moriel's viewing audience cannot find good fellowship where they are, all over the world. I know this because I've seen the comments. I bet you it is very near a 70% figure of the Moriel viewing audience that cannot find good and meaningful fellowship where they are and are absolutely the people whom this series was directed toward. Church for the church. Let's look at the first one. Session four, starting a house church. So Moriel unwittingly condemns a massive swath of their own viewing audience in a desperate attempt to assassinate my character to circumvent the issues the devil is speaking through them. But more than this, Moriel's own Sandy Simpson has no fellowship. Somebody asked him, I believe, on August 5th in their Zoom teaching, Sandy, where do you go to church? His response was, I can't find fellowship at this time. So Sandy Simpson has no fellowship. Does Moriel condemn him as well? Staggering. But perhaps... Most staggering is Jacob himself. Former Moriel board member Amos Farrell confirms Jacob himself does not have a church nor a pastor. So while they're over here uh, grandstanding and pretending um, a situation that doesn't exist in order to detract from legitimate issues, Jacob himself does not attend a church and does not have any oversight We have already seen that his uh, so-called board in Moriel is basically illusory. They're a paper tiger there to collect a check, receiving ten to fifteen thousand dollar Christmas bonuses, so that they look the other way when Jacob's corruption is taking place in front of them. But if Jacob has a church and a pastor, tell him to name them. He won't because he can't. Jacob doesn't attend a church. Who's Jacob's pastor? Let him answer that question. You'll see what a marvelous hypocrite you have in Jacob Prash if you haven't already. Never mind their Church for the Churchless series. They didn't know what to condemn me of, so they just started hurling on the ad hominem. They went on with this big portion. Joshua teaches there are no pastors and elders in the Bible. That's a lie. David Lister approached him privately about his wrong doctrine, and he would not correct it. Marco, at a meeting with Joshua, uh, David Lister, Jacob, and Blair there, Marco tried to explain his wrong doctrine, even using the Greek. Joshua did not accept his correction, not to be offensive here, but Marco could barely explain his position in the English, much less the Greek. What they're referencing is a board meeting in California at the end of 2019. It was about October of 2019, in which I was tendering my resignation from Moriel. They begged me to stay. No, Josh, please, we want you to stay. I said, listen, I've got a lot going on. There were other mounting issues. Jacob was becoming obsessed with Bill Randalls at the time. Many issues, I said, I I don't want to do this anymore. While they were begging me to stay, Marco, who's uh, the spirit of whom the spirit of Cain is alive and well in, this guy's had a chip on his shoulder since he met me. Apparently, threatened, feeling that I came in to take what he's hoping to inherit. Um, This man has uh, had a problem with me since he met me, an invented one. Marco, um, feeling threatened by my stance on ecclesiology, asked me to clarify my position. It was a very awkward time because I offered to debate him on camera, which he wanted no part of. After I explained my position and I was looking at Jacob confused because Jacob and I believe nearly identically 
uh, concerning ecclesiolo- ecclesiology and uh, elders and so forth. And Jacob said during that meeting, Dave Lister and Blair are off in the corner. I'm looking at Jacob and I explain my position. And Jacob says, yeah, yeah, I don't disagree with Josh. I mean, yeah, he's basically right. Marco, I kid you not, stood up and hugged me. He gave me a hug, patted me on the back and said, thank you, brother. I appreciate you clarifying your position. While I sat there and said, I'm willing to debate this point on camera, after I explained everything, just confused, I didn't even know where this was coming from, Jacob looked awkward in the corner because I said, Jacob, you you and I believe basically the same thing. I said, don't you promote Beresford, Job? My idea of ecclesiology is basically his. Yeah, yeah, Beresford's a good guy. He's a good guy. Yeah, we like Beresford. It was supremely awkward. Marco stands up and gives me a hug, and here they try to say, Josh didn't accept his correction. I accepted his hug, in which he thanked me for my clarification. These men are liars. Flat-out liars. Go ask Blair. Go ask Blair Waugh if Marco didn't stand up and hug me and thank me for clarifying my position. This is ridiculous. They said, then Scott Noble emailed Josh. Not then. Scott Noble sent me an email at Marco's behest in 2018, which he apprised Marco. Hey, Marco, I sent that email you wanted. This is Marco. Marco's behind this. He's an instigator who's threatened because he uh, is hoping to inherit what is now the now a burning building, effectively. This is Marco. So Scott Noble emailed Joshua and explained this wrong doctrine in a point-by-point studied email. Josh gave a tepid response, not really addressing his wrong doctrine, nor did he correct it. That's uh, ridiculous. I sent Scott Noble an email. He said, thanks for the clarification. Four days later, when he copied Marco in it, he sent me another one. I didn't even respond to it because I had already copied Jacob. I said, Jacob, what's this about? I called him on Skype. You know what Jacob said? Dad, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with them. Jacob knew this was bogus. Jacob knew I didn't have any wrong doctrine, no serious doctrine, uh, doctrinal uh, disagreement. This is bogus. 2018, and yet you guys have been posting my videos for the last few years? Oh yeah, so serious was my doctrinal error that you kept posting my stuff? Fat chance. Bunch of liars. They continue, this video, the false church system, has caused a division in Moriel, Canada, divided churches there, hurt people in Marco's churches. This is all about Marco. Uh, Who left, even divided Scott Noble's father from the fold. Uh, Look at Blair reached out to Joshua in great kindness, but his advice was rejected too. Well, let's hear from Blair. When Marco kept pushing this, Jacob copied Blair in an email, and Blair contradicts all of them. October 15th, 2020. Dear Jacob from Blair, he says, I saw the video about pastors which Joshua put out as a disagreement and nothing more. That's it. I forwarded to the Nova Scotia people a rebuttal of sorts that Scott Noble had sent. The problem which split the group in Nova Scotia was the fault of some woman raising Joshua to an idol status in her mind, thinking whatever he said had to be God's word on the subject. The split was not Joshua's fault. Personalities are always going to rub some the wrong way. We see this in the disciples of Jesus. The split was not Joshua's fault. Flatly contradicting Moriel's own official statement. It's just staggering. They go on to say he does not believe in paid pastors or even having elders or pastors. This is an absolute lie. His belief concerning paid pastors and leaders is based on a misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 14 in which he states there are no pastors or elders again, which is not scriptural. This is false. They know it's false. Um, my statement was there is no, you will not find salaried pastors in the New Testament. You just don't see that. And if you'd like to debate me on the topic, we can do that too. You know this is true. You're not going to find an example of, where's Paul's salary? How much did Paul get paid? No, he received offerings uh, as they came in, and it wasn't compulsory. So this is bogus. What I said was right. What I said about 1 Corinthians 14 is that as it concerns contribution to a gathering, 
It is not only pastors or elders. Each of you has a, ser- has a hymn, has a teaching, has a, has a psalm, etc. That's what I said. They're lying on purpose. Uh, Joshua teaches there are no pastors and elders in the Bible. Okay. This is their big, Josh has serious doctrinal problems. Oh, yeah. Uh, January 28th of 2020, Jacob sends an email to Linda McIntyre. She's asking him some questions about house churches. Look what he says down here. Our friend Beresford Job is leader of the house church movement in the UK. He also speaks at conference events in the USA. We usually refer interested parties to him. Beresford is their friend. They promote him and recommend him to interested parties, which you're now going to see is proof positive that Moriel knowingly and premeditatedly lied. Beresford Job, Jacob Prash, and Joshua Chavez back-to-back on our stance concerning pastors and elders. Good luck. Leadership by priesthood. Well, you can't get more biblical than that all over the Old Testament. Does that mean the Catholics and Episcopalians were right? And people say, well, the the high priest, the high priest, the priests in the Old Testament are the pastors today. There's zero indication of that. None. There's no such thing as a priest in the New Testament, except for the priesthood of all believers with Jesus as our high priest. We're all priests. Completely unscriptural concept. They have no biblical basis for it. Neither is there any biblical basis for mono-episcopacy in one man's show. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying... There is no leadership. I'm saying that as we know a pastor, as we understand a pastor to be, especially in Western culture, you will not find that within the confines of Scripture. There is no such thing in the New Testament as the minister of a church. There is no such thing in the New Testament as the idea of one man brought in from the outside, the expert to lead a church. Well, Mono Episcopus, he came from such a person, the one-man show, the one-man pastor. The New Testament never, ever puts it all on one man. They resembled nothing of a pastor as we call it today. A pastor today is the sole leader, teacher, CEO of the corporation, funeral director, evangelist, all in one. The idea of the church being led by the minister or the pastor or the priest, doesn't matter what flavor, same deception. That concept is not only completely alien to the New Testament, it is completely antithetical to what the New Testament teaches. It is the exact opposite. If you're in a church with a one-man show, with a senior pastor, is autocratic. At best, you have an unscriptural model of ecclesiastical polity. At worst, you have a formula for heavy shepherding. Notice what it says and what it does not say. It said that they appointed, the apostles, appointed elders, plural, in every church. Why does it not say anything about a senior pastor or a head elder or the main guy? Everywhere the apostles went in the book of Acts and they planted churches, they ordained elders. They didn't appoint a pastor. Every time you see the word bishop or episkopos, it is in the plural. Every time you see the word presbuteros or elder, it is in the plural. The Lord must appoint the leadership. And leadership is plural. <laughs> you just heard back to back statements from all three of us at certain points stating nearly verbatim the exact same thing. The differences were minuscule at best. And they're trying to spin this into, I have serious doctrinal problems. This is an outright lie. 
This is ridiculous. It is their attempt at damage control and spin doctoring to try to conjure up some reason why they had to have a problem with me first after I rebuked them on August 3rd, 2021. There was never any serious disagreement about anything. This is a lie. And as you can see, if I have serious doctrinal problems, then so does Jacob Prash himself. They say in appreciation for the friendship Jacob Prash had with Joshua, Jacob stood with him loyally. So, so what are they saying? Jacob believed Josh had serious doctrinal problems but ignored that, ignored that for personal loyalty? You're only condemning yourself. They don't think these things through. It's irrational. It is the pattern of Saul. It's desperate. It's thrown together like most of what they do, paying a public price for doing so and placing himself uh, not a, not as big a public price as I've paid for standing next to him, um, placing himself in opposition to his own board, in opposition to Marco, jealous, envious Marco, who asked me to teach him how to make videos so he could get more views. That's what Marco the hireling has his mindset on. And when I didn't uh, talk to him about that, what a strange request, he got upset. Jacob tried desperately to be an older brother to Joshua and tried to help him. Jacob has sadly failed. The word of God says that Joshua Chavez cannot be in ministry. Yeah. Here's Moriel's uh, own YouTube channel, right? Jacob, the so-called older brother, Tried to be an older brother to Josh and and uh, help me. Let's see. We got uh, down here. Oh, there's a video that I did on uh, Chris Rosebro. Um, let me see here. Oops. There's a. Um, Video I did on uh, Rick Warren there. There's my video on the Catholic Church. There's our interview about uh, the first seal. There's one on Justin Peters. There's a spiritual abuse one. Uh, Jacob and Moriel have been all too happy uh, to promote me. But remember I said um, that meeting where... Marco ambushed me with 20 questions. Even Jacob was sitting awkwardly in, in the corner. And then he stood up and hugged me, thanking me for my clarification. Thank you, brother. As he stabbed me in the back uh, later. They're all liars. That was in, uh, I think, October of 2019. Here's Jacob about three months later. Three months after my supposed bad doctrine was confronted, here's what Jacob had to say about me three months later. The growth of his own ministry, our service Christus, has caused Joshua to be overloaded. But early in the new year, Joshua will be taking over his own work on a full-time basis and laying down his work with Moriel, for which we are extremely grateful. The tremendous growth that we've had this year was to a large degree, although God's hand and God's blessing, the efforts of Joshua, and we cannot begin to repay him. He will, of course, be still associated with Moriel. He'll still be working in tandem with us. As you can see, they are all rabid liars. Never was there a serious doctrinal disagreement. Uh, they say, now, hopefully you can understand why the board didn't like Josh for his bad doctrine. No, Marco didn't like Josh because he's jealous. Jacob teaches nearly the same thing I do. But they try to accuse me of being a Quaker. But Beresford Job is your friend and someone you recommend? As you can see, this is calculated. It is premeditated. It is all damage control and public relations. It is a combination of the pattern of Saul and the signatures of Satan. When you see ad hominem attack, when you see somebody going after the individual in order to circumvent what they're saying, in order to dodge and evade the issues, that 
is a person who is speaking of the devil. They are speaking from the devil. Jacob Prash admitting the devil is speaking through him and the entire Moriel board. This is a pattern in Jacob's life. Recently, a journalist and author, Jackie Alnor, uh, wrote a uh, five-part uh, article about her time with Moriel, uh, having known Jacob since a- at least the 90s. Here's Moriel's own website. They were promoting her book, Fleecing Christianity. Jackie Alnor is known worldwide for tireless research and well-documented facts which shed light on the sometimes murky depths of cult religions. Okay, they've promoted her for a while. She wrote this series of articles at the Christian Sentinel, which um, I don't know if she operates the website or if she's just an author there. In any event, she's associated with the Christian Sentinel. You can go read her series there, her memories with Moriel, and she details that experience. Jacob Prash responds to Jackie Alnor uh, as the low-blow artist that he is, attacking her person in the most despicable manner possible. Here's what Jacob says. It was no secret that there were marital issues with Bill and Jackie, her late husband, immediately starts attacking her marriage. This is what he does with everybody. He says, without much success... um, We tried to support her ministry. We purchased a load of her books that our publisher couldn't sell, and we couldn't either. This is a tactic of Jacob. He tries to uh, belittle the other people, show himself to be so much better, and it's always about how much they can't sell or how many numbers they don't have. But it was clear that her husband no longer considered her to be his helpmate in ministry. She had a feministic streak of the kind normally associated with what most Christians regard as a Jezebel spirit— often found in women with bad paternal figures in their pre-Christian youth, disgustingly attacking her childhood, at least implicitly. This is filthy behavior. Remember, I don't have it here now, but I'll uh, try to superimpose it if I can remember correctly, his statements toward Jan Markell that we saw in the previous video. He said um, something like, um, that Jan Markell doesn't like men because uh, due to a traumatic childhood of some description, which is why she never married, he said. This is absolutely disgusting. Trying to imply that Jackie Alnor had a bad father, right? Without, uh, he continues, things plainly were not in God's order, but The marital situation was none of my business, and I only reluctantly mention it now in reacting to the hatchet job. This isn't reluctance. This is calculated. Arguably, this is the main thing Jacob wanted to say and built some other fluff around it. This is a gleeful endeavor for Jacob. I only reluctantly mention it. What is this? has nothing to do with anything. This is the character, the black character of Jacob Prash. I only reluctantly mention it uh, now in reacting to the hatchet job Jackie Elnor has done to her husband's legacy in her embittered assault on Moriel and myself. A Christian psychiatrist would likely conclude that she associated a stronger male figure like Bill with an abusive father and associates other men not pandering to her with Bill. You know what a Christian psychiatrist would likely characterize Jacob Prash's behavior as? Psychopathic, if not demonic. This is disgusting. It's about as disgusting as it gets. Suggesting she had an abusive father? Oh, you thought it was bad? It gets worse. Women like this resent male leadership and usually detest male figures who do not acquiesce to them. Down here it says, It became embarrassingly obvious to everyone involved that things were not well. As a Christian, Bill Alnor did not lapse into actual adultery. Um, Bill attempted, it said, Yet without a helpmate in ministry, Bill attempted to fill that emotional and professional void with another woman. This became conspicuous to everyone and was common knowledge. I cannot agree with what Bill Alnor did, but I can certainly understand why he felt driven to do it. The situation became most peculiar and awkward. It was as if at his funeral there were two widows, 
One, a woman whom he desired to love but couldn't, and one, one whom he couldn't love but desired to. What kind of sick, psychotic person says stuff like this? Answer, Jacob Prash, that's who. The rantings of an embittered woman, he says. That, that phrase could characterize the life of Jacob Prash at this point. The rantings of an embittered man. She says, uh, he continues, and little more, I could almost not believe the way she spoke, not simply about myself, but about her late husband, Bill, publicly disrespecting his memory as she has, while he's over here suggesting he had some emotional affair and there were two widows at his funeral. This man is sick. She says, um, she did so in a pursuit of an embittered, an embittered vendetta. Again, Jacob's life story. That's an epitaph right there for him. Embittered vendetta, uh, embittered vendetta, excuse me, is something most saved Christians would call low. To drag her deceased husband out of the grave and in her embittered spirit publicly dishonor him posthumously in pursuit of the same ends is something most saved Christians would find even lower. Such shameful behavior is indeed defiling a root of bitterness. I don't know if Moriel and Jacob could be more defiled or more bitter or more disgusting at this point. You're watching the workings of a madman and a so-called board that not only stands by this, they actively promote it all. Talking about her dead husband, this is all to retaliate. This is pure and unadulterated vengeance of the kind typically associated with psychopaths who do not have empathy at all. A proud man, a reprobate, a corrupted mind. That's Jacob Prash. That's what he does. When you see ad hominem attack to circumvent the issues, the devil is speaking through them. That's Jacob. And it gets worse. Here's an email he sent to a former friend named Sally Richardson. Sally Richardson does not have a ministry. She's an older woman who lives in England who nobody knows from Adam. But if you dare to cross the great and powerful Prash, he will try to destroy your life, which is what he did with Sally Richardson. So he sent this response to her June 1st, uh, 2021, after she made some comments uh, about Jacob. He begins mutually unpleasant greetings. Listen, this is how he starts it. I think you remember me. I'm the villain who flew your daughter's remains home from Australia when you could not afford to do so, so that your little girl's body could be buried on English soil and you could have a proper family funeral. What an utterly compassion-lacking wretch I must be to do such an ugly thing. Every word here is deliberately chosen. This is very calculated verbiage, and Jacob is trying to hurt this woman. He is trying to open up an old wound to hurt her. Listen, your daughter's remains so your little girl's body could be buried? This man is sick. It would be a marvel to me if Satan himself has not entered Jacob Prash at this point. This is disgusting. If you don't want to throw up in your mouth right now reading this, I doubt whether you have a conscience at all. Not only is this disgusting, it's false. Oh, her daughter did die in Australia, and they did have to fly her body, body home. But Jacob acts like he did this by himself. He's a liar. He's a manipulator. Jacob or Moriel supplied a comparatively paltry 700 great British pounds out of a total 15,000 pound expense to fly her daughter back to the United Kingdom. So out of 15,000 pounds, Jacob contributes 700 and acts like he did it by himself. I'm the villain who flew your daughter's remains home. This is sick. Everything about him is sick and twisted. His so-called friend David Berkowitz would rebuke him 
Jacob appears to be worse currently than David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, was in his prime. And I bet Jacob Prash has talked to him all of, uh, you know, one time in his life and pretends like they're best friends. This is disgusting. So not only is he trying to hurt her with this language, he pays $700, let's call it, out of 15000 and acts like he saved the day and then throws it back in her face to get back at her because she had the audacity to question his behavior? You're looking at the ramblings of a psychopath. Talk about embittered vendetta. This is insane. But he continues. He goes on to accuse her of adultery. Um, accusing her of a, a first remarriage, an unscriptural remarriage to light, and now your alleged separation from your second husband. He says, I didn't join in the chorus of those pastors who know you, who agreed that by the standard of God's word, you're an adulteress. I largely remain deliberately silent. If what Jesus said concerning divorce and remarriage meant nothing to you, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this is false. This woman has had one husband. That didn't stop Jacob from accusing her of having two and separating from the second because he's a liar. He's a pathological, psychopathic liar. Because I always liked you personally and felt compassion for you due to the loss of your daughter, I stepped back. Although I felt hurt and betrayed, I said nothing. Even when I was criticized for not publicly addressing your marital situation that the scripture calls adultery. Who, who criticized you for not publicly addressing her situation, Jacob? The same people, the same invisible people that ask you to speak in Hebrew and pray in Hebrew at every uh, gathering? Nobody, pub- nobody criticized him. Who knows who Sally Richardson is? I was criticized for not publicly addressing your marital situation. You're a liar, Jacob. This is all concocted so that he can justify himself in doing what he wants to do. Just like he did with Jackie Alnor. I only reluctantly mention this in passing. That was Jacob's whole goal, was to try to talk about her marriage because he's sick and twisted. These are lies. He makes up lies, calculated. Let's face it, you were always misled by your emotions into following wrong men. He says, look at." These may not be sexual, but they are ungodly fixations that blind you, he says. No, Sally, in God's eyes, it's you who engage in calumny, and unless you repent, if those pastors are factually correct, if he has no evidence of this, none, and yet he moves forward, calling her an adulteress. Watch. You will receive God's the judgment of an adulteress. I believe them. But I decline to speak out against you, Mustang. Yet God's word is clear. He continues here. Listen. Listen to the threats of this psycho. You have now made a grave error, Sally. For the sake of peace, I tried to ignore you, hoping you would do the same. Now you've been manipulated by a wicked woman into publicly attacking me. I wish you had not. I tried to avoid conflict with you, but now you have sought conflict with me. So be it. This will now have repercussions that I would have wished to avoid, Sally. The Lord will judge. And against my wishes, you force us to respond to any who contact us. Oh, I didn't want to tell people about what I don't even have confirmation of, but you forced me. You forced me to take vengeance because you dared to say anything about me. What a sick, twisted man. I didn't want this, Sally. I truly did not. For old time's sake, I left you alone, preferring to remember you as Mustang Sally, rather than as an unscripturally divorced and remarried adulterous daughter of darkness. I profoundly wish you had done the same. I really do. This was so unnecessary. Frankly, it was also very foolish of you to allow yourself to be manipulated and dragged into a conflict like this. I wish you had first contacted me, Sally. I would not have turned you away. As disappointed as I am, I fear for you, Sally, and you remain in my prayers, for you do not know what you do. Your former friend and brother, who tried to show you compassion and the love in the love of Jesus whenever I could. Do you see the maniacal threats? There's now going to be repercussions, Sally. Oh, you should have never crossed me. I wouldn't have said anything, but now, now I'm going to say. Now, if what they're saying is true. You force me to respond to people who contact me about you. These things are false. Jacob is a calculated liar. He invents things. I've never seen 
anything quite like this. Never. I expect better from Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen. Leave it to Jacob Prash to stoop this low. This is what he does. He invents lies about those who come against him. When you see this, the devil is speaking through them. He is a false witness and a habitual one at that. Now, as we've already seen, for the better part of 30 years, Jacob Prash has been impersonating a Jew, being Jewish in general. But it seems he wanted to make his impersonation more specific and began doing some kind of impersonation of this Jew, Jerry Springer. Jacob Prash has more in common with Jerry Springer than Jesus Christ, and I suspect Jerry Springer would be disgusted, utterly repulsed by the actions and behaviors of Jacob Prash. This is Jacob. It's little wonder that he would try to do the same with me. This man is desperate. Listen. It all becomes an exercise in public relations. Image manipulation. They're more afraid of what people may think than what God already knows. That's right. So as with Sally Richardson, it was an exercise in image manipulation. I will destroy your character at all cost so that people won't want to listen to what you have to say. This is the spirit of those who persecuted the prophets. It's nothing different. He lied about Jackie Alnor. He lied about Sally Richardson. He lied about Jan Markell. He's lied about everybody. It's a little wonder that he would try to do the same with me. That's what he resorts to. The man has no conscience. And yet Jacob Prash condemns himself and refutes himself as a false witness. The false allegations that he's tried to level against me in order to distract from irrefutable actual proof and evidence against him doesn't have a leg to stand on, not even from Jacob's own mouth. Here's what he said to his friend Dean over at Dean Gibson's YouTube channel, September 11th, 2020. After these uh, false allegations emerged from an equally uh, maniacal man named Jordan Hall, whom Jacob encouraged me to sue, by the way. He says, blessings. Hall is a wicked, demonized liar, says Jacob. He has a very ugly history, including one episode where a troubled 15-year-old boy committed suicide. Jacob is a, uh, Joshua is a friend with a ministry which, uh, with which we have at times cooperated. But he is not a member of the Moriel team, and we cannot speak for him. However, we do know that Joshua is being maliciously lied against by the proponents of Doreen Virtue. And while I cannot speak for him, I can and will defend him from outrageous charges made by vicious religious delinquents, of which he is 100% not guilty. Jacob Prash knows he's a liar and condemns himself now as a religious delinquent knowing for a fact I am 100% not guilty of the very charges he has tried to regurgitate against me in his own desperation. He continues here, April of this year, um, about Marco. When the question was asked, Marco firmly stated that you have done nothing morally improper. Well, how about it? Even Marco, even Marco the hireling knows These are lies, and yet he stands idly by while Jacob propagates them. These men are sick. May 3rd, 2021, Jacob wrote to a group of people in New Zealand, If slander and defamation were music, whoever wrote these outlandish lies would be a brass band. Joshua Chavez is not a Moriel team member. He is a friend, however, and he's one of the ministries always being attacked by those who hate me, John Haller being another. We do sometimes post his well-produced videos. He has his own channel called Service Christie that is friendly to Moriel. There is currently one of his videos on Moriel TV and RTN TV entitled Spiritual Abuse, which I strongly suggest you watch. He continues, 
these things concerning Joshua Chavez are absolutely not true. And he concludes, in any event, it has nothing to do with Moriel or myself. I and the Moriel board, however, are aware of these allegations. So do the believers in his house church. Oh, I, I thought I had no fellowship, Jacob. So were you lying then or are you lying now? Jacob can't get his own lies in order. So much for that one, huh, Jacob? Staggering. Please watch the current video on Moriel TV or on his Service Christi YouTube channel or on RTN TV. I think it will explain why he is so hated. Spiritual abuse. It's a current video. Regards to Diane in Jesus, Jacob. The video he's referring to here uh, was still on Moriel as of a few days ago. They've only recently deleted it. Gospel gangsters and Bible bullies. Jacob was eager to have this posted on Moriel TV, and it's been up there uh, for months. For months, Jacob said, please go watch it. It will explain the genesis of these malicious false allegations for which he himself urged me to sue Jordan Hall over. It's now gone from Moriel's channel. You can watch it on the Service Christi channel, the Ministry Mafia and Theological uh, Thugs, which I also strongly encourage you to watch. This is how desperate Jacob has become. He says... February 25th, 2021, for Justin Peters. Joshua Chavez did nothing legally or morally improper. The allegations of human trafficking by that malicious, if not demonized liar, J.D. Hall, are patently and demonstrably absurd. Your colleague J.D. Hall is already engaged in predatory behavior toward a mentally disturbed victim, and a 15-year-old kid is in his grave. Instead of responding to the video indictment of you by Joshua Chavez because you are factually unable to do so, you take the ad hominem angle and maliciously fabricate a factually bogus concocted allegation about him. You have missed your true calling, Justin. You should really be working at CNN. It is rather both children of Chris Rosebro who are guilty of what you falsely ascribe to Joshua Chavez, apparently Jacob now condemning himself as one who should have been working at CNN. He is a malicious liar. I'm not the only target of his lies. This is what he does. Jacob Prash condemns himself. Literally resorting to taking the talking points of a man he encouraged me to sue, taking those talking points to try to use against me in an act of pure and unadulterated retaliation. He knows for a fact this is false. All of it. Joshua Chavez did nothing legally or morally improper. Nothing. And he knows that's the case. They all do. On Moriel's own website, there's a post he made after these false allegations. He posted this about Jordan Hall and a Braxton Canner incident. In memory of Braxton Canner, 2020 painfully marks the sixth Christmas that Braxton Canner will not be with his family, who will remain haunted by an ugly tragedy that never, ever should have happened. Have a very Merry Christmas, J.D. Hall. Baptist Times implicated J.D. Hall in suicide of 15-year-old boy. J.D. Hall repents for interaction with suicidal teen. Jacob Prash has called Jordan Hall a predator because of this behavior. And I say to you now that Jacob Prash is the very same predator. Every bit the liar Jordan Hall is, and worse, Jacob knows that these are maliciously fabricated, factually bogus, concocted allegations. And yet the devil so has a hold of him that he had to resort to Jordan Hall talking points to try to attack me. Absolutely disgusting. As somebody pointed out on YouTube, they said, don't you think if Josh knew they had all this actual dirt on him, why would he have ever attacked Moriel or ever gone up against them publicly? That's exactly right. You should ask yourself why I don't seem worried about this. Oh, it's disgusting. It's bothersome when people lie about you. But a curse without a cause shall not alight. Mm. Jacob is every bit the predator, the exploitative predator that Jordan Hall is. 
I can I can envision a new ministry emerging. Pirates, polemics, and Prash, the new ministry mafia, with Jordan Hall, Chris Rosebro, and Jacob Prash. These men are malicious liars. Disgusting. But watch what Jacob says. On August 25th, he was getting nervous. I hadn't said anything. Down here is this kind of blackmail threat. Drop this, Joshua. I don't want to be forced to use the ammunition I have against you. I don't hate you. I just hate betrayal. You have another view. Right? Remember what he said to Sally Richardson. Oh, I didn't want to be forced to do this. There's going to be repercussions now. Moriel Board's own statement, August 7th, said, We do not wish to disclose the contents of the emails we have from her and other emails because they are none of anyone's business, and to do so would be pure vengeance against him. Sincerely, the Moriel Board. Jacob Prash and the Moriel Board, admitting their motives, are pure vengeance. Not only was it pure vengeance, but it was pure hogwash. Yeah, but Josh, he, he read this uh, email. It sounded strange. Yeah, why don't you tell Jacob to read you his response to that email? I bet he won't. This is absolutely atrocious. Again, go watch the video, Spiritual Abuse, the Ministry Mafia, and Theological Thugs, where the genesis of this bogus defamation was detailed. Jacob is a liar, a habitual and pathological liar, a premeditated false witness whose conscience has apparently been completely eradicated. And he has created a culture, a group of voyeurs and vultures who appear to have appetites similar to those of the Jerry Springer audience. Who will listen to claims without any evidence whatsoever, but will ignore irrefutable evidence against their fallen master, Jacob Prash, who himself acknowledges that he ought to be working at CNN and worse. This is what he does. He's a liar. He has been a liar. He didn't stop there. Going on to suggest that uh, I'm not uh, I'm not qualified. I'm uneducated because I didn't go to college. First of all, I did go to college. I uh, discontinued going to college. I dropped out, if you will, because I didn't find it a good uh, ex- uh, investment. So after a few years of studying philosophy, majoring in philosophy. I left of my own choice. Listen, facts speak for themselves. Jacob Prash would have condemned John Bunyan. John Bunyan had less of an education than I do. This is the behavior of Jacob Prash, stooping so low to attack anything. You know the devil is speaking through him. Attempting to attack my work history? John Bunyan was a tinker. How low will this man go? He knows no limits. That's how desperate he is. That's how sad this tale has become. What would Jacob say about Paul the Apostle? He didn't have his life in order. He was just a tent maker, a mere tent maker. Peter, James, and John... Andrew, those guys were just fishermen. They didn't even have their lives in order. Jesus, he was just a lowly carpenter. It's not an honorable profession. He didn't even have his life in order. That's what Jacob Prash would say. But you know, we had another individual in the book of Acts chapter 6 named Stephen. Stephen was just a lowly server of tables. Lowly server of tables, but mighty in power and works in the church. And a group of religious narcissists came and disputed with Stephen from the 
synagogue of the freedmen, they're called. And it says, when they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke. They were not able to resist him. Just this lowly waiter of tables. They couldn't contend with Stephen. Why? Because it wasn't Stephen. What does Jesus say in the Gospel of Luke? The Lord himself will give you a a mouth of wisdom, which all of your adversaries will not be able to gainsay or resist. They couldn't stand that they couldn't refute this lowly waiter of tables named Stephen. So what did they do? They secretly induced men. They stirred up the people and they gathered false witnesses against him to kill him. That's what they did. That's what Jacob Prash would have done. Stephen, he was just a lowly waiter of tables. He didn't even have his life in order. And yet all those religious narcissists could not resist. They couldn't contend with the wisdom or the spirit by which Stephen spoke. Religious hypocrites will always attack in the lowest manner possible. It's coming from a place of their own insecurity, their own cowardice. Just like he says to Justin Peters, remember, instead of responding to the video indictment of you by Joshua Chavez because you are factually unable to do so, you take the ad hominem angle and maliciously fabricate a factually bogus concocted allegation about him. You've missed your true calling, Justin. You really should be working at CNN. Jacob wouldn't even qualify to work at CNN. He has no option but to take the character assassination approach in a desperate attempt to avoid the judgment that he knows he's currently under. The pattern of Saul on full display. From that point on, Saul knew that David was the one who was going to get the kingdom. God left you in the driver's seat up to a certain point till David was ready, but now God is getting ready to put David into position. So what does Saul do? He tries to kill David. The backslidden leader will go after the new fellowship and its leaders. Character assassination, slander. They'll attack the new leaders. That's what they do. They begin bad-mouthing. Saul will always try to kill David. The new leaders who God raises up are going to be the primary targets of the backslidden ones who no longer hear from God. It's, it's eerie to hear this. Again, this isn't so much that I'm the David in this story, but it is that Jacob is the Saul in this story. You can see it. You can see it clear as day, and it is frightening. Exactly what Saul did to David is exactly what he's doing to me. Jacob, like Saul, obsessed with numbers. If anybody's listened to Jacob, especially in the last year or two, you have heard him ad nauseum talk about Moriel's growth, Moriel's growth, Moriel's growth. Moriel's growing like gangbusters. Moriel has quadrupled, he says here. He compares himself to other people. Menelaus and 24 GV 24 7 doesn't even have 1% of the viewership of Moriel TV. Believers in Grace Ministry of Bill Randall's has diminished. Those people aren't coming back. God's hand has been removed even prior to COVID. The itinerary ministry of Bill Randall's is an author whose books won't sell. Remember when he tried to do the same thing to Jackie Alnor? Nobody even wants to buy their books. I wonder how many people are, you know, buying Jacob Prash's books was already plummeting. I take no delight in witnessing the decline of such ministries. That's a lie. He's just writing this with a smile. None at all. On the contrary, there was a time I only wished them well. And I can only say to myself that I and Moriel should take heed, lest the Lord likewise removes his hand from us. They absolutely should have taken heed. But you have seen Jacob's obsession with numbers. We're growing, we're growing. Moriel keeps growing. Listen to Jacob. When you see a leader begin worrying about numbers and about setbacks, 
placing that as the priority above what the Word of God says, you already have a problem. Once you see people pursuing a numbers game, numbers equals power and money. Attendance figures and things like that. You're going to have a problem. Now it's going. Well, Jacob has become obsessed with numbers, and he's right. They do have a problem, and it is going. In the aftermath of all of this, as longtime supporters, both prayerfully and financially, in every way, have watched this decline in Jacob, people are leaving Moriel in droves. It is plummeting as we speak. Longtime supporter and de facto Hong Kong representative writes a 16-page letter to Moriel on August 16th. At present time, at the present time, I wish to withdraw from public support of the ministry. This is the aftermath of all that you've been seeing. This is just what has been happening, and it will continue to get worse. Remember, Saul was afraid the people uh, were, were scattering from him. So he went and did what he shouldn't do. He lived in rebellion because he was more worried about the people. The pattern of Saul on full display. Listen. I have an ordination credential. It is with a recognized mainstream evangelical organization. It is called Christian Ministerial Fellowship International CMFI. But it's just a mainstream evangelical organization. I hold credentials with them. Well, Jacob held credentials with them. In the aftermath of all of this, you can see the Council of Elders at CMFI, so-called elders, John Anglis, Paul Sherbert, Ian Huxham, and another gentleman. Um, they, um, they made a statement. There's Paul Sherbert. Just a, a few days after um, I made a statement saying that Moriel's credentials had been revoked by CMFI, Moriel makes this priority announcement saying, for some time, they've, we've grappled with CMFI being UK-based. This is bogus. Uh, geographical issues they chalk it up to have been problematic. Um, they said, so because of these geographical issues, Moriel has resigned on good and amicable terms and without acrimony. CMFI then adds to this, with their official statement from Paul Sherbert saying, with regard to your resignation, he says, um, uh, to dispel and correct the current rumors and lies, um, I had made a post saying that their credentials had been revoked. Paul Sherbert continues, for the sake of truth, CMFI hereby gives notice that following the discussion, Moriel members have resigned their membership to CMFI. This was all a lie. This email from Paul Sherbert was sent to Amos Farrell, former board member of Moriel Ministries as well, who was also credentialed with CMFI. You can see they say here, as I copied them all in my letter on August 3rd, we have been copied. Um, we're communicating with you over the tsunami of correspondence into which we have been copied concerning folk who are or have been associated with Moriel Ministries. This we have found very distressing. Much of this is internal and some of a very serious nature. They continue down here. It is clear in more recent times that there are serious issues within Moriel which require addressing. Despite its best efforts, CMFI has not has uh, been unable to get to the bottom of these issues, and as there have been CMFI members both within Moriel on both sides of these issues, after careful, prayerful, and uh, consideration, we have taken the very difficult decision to withdraw membership from all CMFI members involved with Moriel in these disputes. As you can see, they both conspired to lie to give Jacob this um, nice, peaceful, amicable exit strategy. Moriel did not resign. Their membership was withdrawn in the wake of all of this legitimate controversy because other CMFI members were getting fed up with Jacob and Moriel and put pressure on Paul Sherbert and CMFI to have them removed from the organization. Everybody can see the writing on the wall. Jacob and Moriel are corrupt and going down. So, Jacob says 
Josh is the ventriloquist of truth clips and one or two such other people. You might ask, why would CMFI lie on Jacob's behalf? Because Jacob is the real ventriloquist. Here's another email from Jacob to CMFI, who was planning to draft a defense of him, little did I know, just before I published my, uh, uh, sent my email. Jacob sends this email to them. Please do not see this email as any attempt to influence the content or drafting of the letter that CMFI is preparing in response to Menelaus. I simply refer to items of concern to myself and Moriel. CMFI was going to write their response to uh, Deborah Menelaus had questions for them, apparently. So Jacob sends them an idea, a template, his own defense of himself, speaking about himself in the third person. Jacob Prash has every right to object, he says. Jacob Prash denies firmly. Jacob Prash and Moriel don't trust you. You have bombarded CMI, CMFI with everything from veiled threats to endless emails. How ironic, considering there's now evidence that Jacob and his friend Charles were behind a veiled death threat. Let it be clear that CMFI stands with Moriel and others of our ministers whom you are attacking. The facts are in their favor. For the sake of body, the body, CMFI would prefer this end. You can see the point. Jacob Prash wrote his own defense and then sent it to CMFI so that they could use it for him. Jacob Prash is the real ventriloquist here. This is why CMFI conspired to lie when they knew that they had withdrawn his membership. In any event, you can see people getting away from Jacob and Moriel, and it continues. One of their largest um, supporters and sister ministries or cooperations is Moriel Ministries, Be Alert Moriel Ministries. They changed their name to Be Alert Prophecy in the News just, I believe, yesterday, October 14th. Today is the 15th. The timing is not accidental. A week after my video exposing Jacob and the people at Be Alert Moriel Ministries changed their name and offer this statement, very much like CMFI, um, so that they themselves don't look implicated. Uh, there comes We've uh, um, been blessed by other Moriel staff members. We're grateful for their guidance, but there comes a time in everyone's life when they need to venture out on their own and take that time, that time's come for us and this page, we've decided with the blessing of the Moriel board to take this page back to its roots and follow the prophetic guidance, etc., etc. CMFI did a very similar thing. We've resigned on amicable terms. You know why these people are petrified of Jacob? Because he's psychotic. He will attack them relentlessly, like he did with Sally, like he did with Jackie, like he'll do with anybody, like he'll do with me. He'll probably be preoccupied with me for the rest of his life, I'd imagine. But the timing isn't an accident. They see Moriel is crumbling. They know Jacob is corrupt. And now they're trying to cover themselves by dissociating from them, having an unofficial relationship with them. So they want to have their cake and eat it too. They're hypocrites. There's Suzanne Baruch over at uh, Moriel Be Alert. They'll never call out Jacob's corruption for reasons of their own uh, not implicating themselves or not being embarrassed and also not to incur the wrath of Prash. Many reasons, but it's obvious. People are getting away from Jacob in droves. Here's Social Blade. Social Blade uh, tracks trends and so forth of various YouTube channels. You can see Moriel has decreased in the last week by over 500 subscribers. People are leaving Moriel TV in droves. It is not growing. It is declining. It is plummeting. They went from 36.8 to 36.3 just in a week, and it will continue. People are leaving Moriel. They are getting away from Jacob. They see that he is corrupt. That's Moriel TV. Go unsubscribe immediately if you have not done so already. Even Jacob has something to say about this. And you want to know why your numbers went from 2,500 to 900 and sink you? <laughs> the Lord's rejected you! The Lord has indeed rejected Jacob and Moriel. This is, without question, in my personal experience, the most tragic and the biggest fall I have ever seen. 
for somebody that knows so much to be so dark, so base, so evil, with such calculation, it's about as bad as it gets. And there's a lot of people confused. I don't know what to do with this. I've benefited so much from his teaching. So have I. Please read my letter. Well, maybe he'll repent. Even Jacob says, when you see these patterns gain hold and traction, there's no stopping it. Jacob's judgment is the greater. Teachers already held or held to a stricter judgment, but to whom much is given, much will be required. And Jacob knows more than most. All judgment is not the same. Remember, Jesus rebuked all the cities in which he had done great works. And he said, if the works that had been done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented in sackcloth and ash long ago. Therefore, it will be worse for you in the day of judgment. Worse for you. Some will be beaten with few stripes, some with many. This corruption is unbelievable. And yet it's undeniable. You're watching it. You have seen the very patterns of Saul and the signatures of Satan emerge in Jacob Prash himself. How can it be? How can somebody who knows so much fall so far? Knowledge isn't the problem. Pride is the problem. But because of all that knowledge, the judgment will indeed be the worse. This is beyond tragic, and yet, this is not the judgment of Joshua. You're watching the judgment of the Lord. He may be using my lips at this particular juncture, but that's it. And I also know that I am not fighting against Jacob Prash or the so-called cult of Moriel. I'm not fighting against flesh and blood. Behind all of this, behind all of this vicious, calculated, false witness, the spin doctoring, the character assassination, principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness are behind it. And yet Moriel and Jacob think they're fighting against Josh, and they're wrong as well. Or not, maybe I shouldn't say as well, but they are wrong, because I know I'm not fighting against them. But they're not fighting against me. They are fighting against the Lord. They are fighting against righteousness. They are sinning against mercy. Do you not fear God, man? Do you not even fear God? This is frightening. But they're blinded. They will continue to protest their innocence in the face of irrefutable evidence. As people are leaving in droves, they'll try to spin it as, ah, this is persecution. No, this is not persecution. You are not a martyr. This is God's judgment. And the blindness to it is also a part of God's judgment. He who is rebuked often and hardens his heart will be destroyed suddenly and that without remedy. Remedy. God forbid. But this is where we are. We're watching the pattern of Saul. And sadly, I believe you're going to continue watching the pattern of Saul. Jacob may be well on his way to Endor, so to speak, if he's not already on his way back. And the body of Christ is in jeopardy by this man, specifically the remnant. And that's why I deem this so necessary. Those whom I believe are sincerely seeking truth, the remnant believers are those that need to be spared from Jacob's soul-ensnaring leaven. 
may the Lord remove him before any more little ones are caused to stumble. And may we all take serious note of these things and reflect deeply because this ought to frighten all of us. But there are not words so eerie as the words of Jacob Prash himself. I think about myself. So many of the people who have been used of Satan to mislead the church in these last days from within, so many of them began right. It's a frightening prospect. How do you know when Satan is speaking through Christians? Not self-willed, not quick-tempered. That's one thing I struggle with terribly. I can get pretty angry sometimes. How do you know when Satan is speaking from the pulpit? If somebody's not in control of themselves, God's not in control of them. Because God speaks to a pastor or a teacher does not mean he's always going to get it right. Even if the motives of his heart are right, that does not mean what he's saying is right. Well, things go on and people think it's business as usual. They're not looking at the underlying dynamic of what's really transpiring. Things do tend to go on for a while. Things are wrong, but people tend to ignore it. Hoping or imagining it's going to get better, but it will not get better. Unless there's a repentance, it never gets better. It can only eventually get worse, but it may take some time. How do you know when Satan is speaking within the body of Christ? Things go on, but then the downward spiral gains momentum. Indeed, how can we be sure in a given instance Satan is not speaking through us? You put on a big religious show with a lot of fanfare. Oh, we're praising the Lord. We're serving the Lord. Now you're in rebellion. I'm only asking the question. Are you a leader who should be a leader? Or are you a leader who should get out of leadership? Is your pastor somebody who should be a pastor? Or is your pastor somebody who should be removed from the ministry? And he tries to kill David. Saul will go after David. The leaders of a backslidden church will go after the leaders of a faithful one. The old boss will come after the new one. This is about self-preservation, self-interest, monument to self. It's no longer about Jesus. That's the way it is. That's how it happens. That's how it's always happened. If somebody does something serious, he's out. But a lot of the most reprobate people, a lot of the most notorious apostates began right. They began with right motives. They began with right doctrine. They began with an honest desire to serve Jesus. I don't care how gifted they are. They're not known by their gifts, they're known by their fruits. They have no right to be there. When confronted, even when demonstrably shown to be guilty, their religious narcissism prevails. It's everybody's fault but theirs. Oh, he repented. Then he won't be in the ministry. You accept the ramifications of what you did. Do me a big favor. Please do me a favor. Do yourselves a bigger one. If you see this pattern in Jacob Prash, Please come and tell me. 
but come to me quickly that I can put it right before it's too late. Because once this pattern gains momentum, there's no stopping it. It takes on an inertia of its own. If God forbid I should ever go down morally, do me a favor. Never come listen to me speak, even if I could deceive myself into thinking I should be able to. I should never be able to if I ever did that. May God keep me from that. But the robe gets cut. What would later happen at the cave of Ein Gedi? David did not kill Saul, even when he had the drop on him. But he cut the robe. <whistles> hey, Saul, remember this? Remember what Samuel told you? It's over, big boy. What I say is, if it happened to them, it can happen to us. If it happened to him, it can happen to me. As Paul puts it, let he who stands take heed lest he fall. They will give account to the Lord. It says in James 3.1, let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be ju judged more strictly than the rest. When we appear before Jesus, he's going to hold me more accountable than he holds most of you. He's going to hold me more accountable than he holds most of you.